In this episode, I want to go into a deep exploration and discussion about the problems that I see with Andrew Tate and specifically his philosophy, which is in the news lately and has been popular of late, and I see it is um, misguiding many young men. I'm not interested in demonizing Andrew Tate here or presenting evidence as those in some kind of criminal trial against him. Uh, I'm more interested in the very big picture. Um, we're not going to get bogged down to little nitty -ditty, gritty details of who said what and did he really do this or that thing there. That's for the authorities and for the rest of the internet to adjudicate. Um, there's plenty of evidence you can find online of Andrew Tate talking about the things that uh, he's accused to be guilty of and so forth. And in the end, it'll be resolved in the courtroom. But uh, there's more than just the legal ramifications here. Even if he's completely vindicated, legally speaking, that's not the end of it because there's a philosophy behind what he's teaching. And that is the thing that men are finding appealing and also that I find troublesome. And uh, we want to discuss that whole can of worms. Uh, I'm just gonna riff here. This is completely stream of consciousness. I have uh, a lot of thoughts about this and that's because I have actually quite a bit, quite a bit of experience in the various industries and fields that Tate is a part of um, you might wonder like, well, Leo, who are you <laughs> to sit here and judge Tate and all this kind of stuff and say that he's bad or that he's wrong? This is going to be a much deeper analysis. And really, this episode here is not intended for those of you who already agree that Tate has done bad things or is a bad person. This is for those of you who admire Tate and who are finding his philosophy appealing, and you can't quite understand why the rest of society doesn't agree with you, and you might think that Tate is being persecuted, or he's being misunderstood, or the matrix is out to get him, and you might not see the problems in his philosophy. And I wanna point those out to you because, look, I really sympathize with your situation as a young man. Uh, it's hard to find good role models, you see a lot of toxic stuff online. It's difficult to get laid these days because of social media, because we don't socialize that much anymore. Nobody taught you how to socialize. Nobody really taught you how to treat women properly. Nobody taught you how to date. Nobody taught you how to attract women. Uh, it's also hard for you to make money these days. You know, bad economy, uh, po po late stage capitalism, hard to make money these days. So, you know, when Andrew Tate comes along and he promises you fast access to beautiful women and to cars and to money and to houses and to this attractive lifestyle and to this kind of like macho masculine vibe, this can seem very appealing to many young men. Uh, I have a lot of experience going through my own journey of growing up as a man, figuring this stuff out, because when I started off, I was very much in the dark about many of these things. Not only with dating and women and stuff like pickup advice and attraction advice, but uh, also with online business. I started my own online businesses, successful ones that I ran, you know, passive income, if that's the kind of stuff you're interested in. I have a lot of experience with that. I'm, I'm deeply, intimately aware of, of all these passive income online business in a box type of industries and schemes that are out there. I've studied a lot of them. Uh, I'm very well aware of many of the scams that exist within these industries. These are very shady, uh, dirty sorts of industries, which is not to say that all of it is bad, but there's a lot of shady characters operating within these industries, much like Andrew Tate himself is. And there's a lot of shady characters operating within the dating advice for men, the pickup industry as well. I have a lot of experience with that as well. So I can bring together um, many of this kind of inside knowledge that I have about these industries. Um, I've met many of the best dating coaches in the world, hung out with them, gotten advice from them, um, seen, 
seen how they operate, how they attract girls, how they treat women. I've seen behind the scenes their relationships, how toxic they are, how abusive they can be. Um, I've seen some of the best pickup coaches in the world struggle with addiction problems, with alcohol problems, with consistency problems. They can't even show up on time for their clients to a boot camp because they're so wasted or because they just don't have their shit together. But in their videos, they present themselves as though they're, you know, these smooth, suave characters. And so uh, I have a lot of behind the scenes kind of dirt that I'll share with you. Um, a lot of deep insight there, but also over a decade of study of psychology, how the human ego works, psychological development, developmental psychology, spirituality, what it really takes to develop yourself spiritually and what it really takes to be happy in life as a man. Because ultimately that's what you want, right? If, if you find Andrew Tate's philosophy and movement appealing, uh, that's why, because you think it's gonna bring you to happiness. And that's the greatest problem with what he's teaching is that it won't. It will instill you with many bad inner beliefs and mental habits that will make it impossible for you to have happy, successful relationships with women for a decade or more to come in your life. So I'm not your enemy here. If you think that I'm here to attack Tate or to attack those of you guys who are supporters of Tate, I'm not your enemy at all. Uh, my agenda here, I don't really care about Tate. I, I wish him well. Um, if he has committed certain crimes, then I wish that justice in, is rendered fairly in whatever country those crimes were committed in. I, I really don't have a, a dog in this race, but what I do see is an opportunity to help some of these men who have been misled. And I have a lot of experience seeing men who have been misled by the pickup industry and by the red pill movement. And then I'm seeing a lot of carry over and cross over between that group of men and then those who are attracted to Andrew Tate. Uh, a lot of times it's the exact same men. In fact, many of my pickup buddies, they think of Andrew Tate very highly <laughs> in very high regard. Um, and we had discussions about this, you know, before he blew up and before he got arrested and all this stuff, we had discussions. In fact, I remember the first time I heard about Andrew Tate, this was maybe a year ago, uh, my wing and I, you know, I live in Vegas here, uh, my wing and I, we were walking to the club, uh, probably, you know, around midnight as we usually do. We were walking there, we were just talking, and then he says, hey, Leo, have you heard of this guy, Andrew Tate? I'm like, no, what about him? Why, why would I care about him? And he says, you gotta, you gotta check out his videos, man. He's, he's very impressive. I'm like, really, well, why? Like, what's he gonna tell me that I don't already know? And then he's like, well, you know, he, he used to be a professional kickboxer, and then he stopped doing that, and then he, um, and now he he's, he's has like 20 fast cars, and he's got all these hot girls, and, uh, and, he's got, and he's got tens of millions of dollars, and I'm like, yeah, well, how do he make all these tens of millions of dollars? Because it, it was obvious to me that you don't make that kind of money as a kickboxer. And then my friend is like, well, you know, he has a, he has a, a webcam company with these girls and they get naked for money. As soon as I heard that to my friend, I said something along the lines of, oh, okay, this guy must be the biggest scumbag in the world. <laughs> Just because I've dealt with so many of these kinds of characters throughout my life, um, these sorts of hustlers, swindlers, con artist types, these wheelers and dealers, uh, they love to posture, they love to puff themselves up, these, these sort of Ty Lopez types. You know, these, these kind of types. You know, the Lambo in, in the, oh, oops, guys, there's a Lambo in, in just by accident, there's a Lambo in, in, the, in the back of my garage and I'm, I'm filming in here. <laughs> this kind of stuff, right? So I have a lot of experience with these, kinds of, uh, with these kinds of characters navigating around these kinds of characters and the kinds of tricks that they use to run their schemes. And so it was obvious, just I didn't even, see any video of his. So just the, the first few things that I heard about him just from my wing immediately told me the kind of character that he, that he is. And of course, you know, first appearances can be deceiving. So of course you don't want to just, you know, judge a book by its cover all the time. That was just a little, you know, comment that I just kind of noted in the back of my own mind and I didn't think anything of it until, you know, the year went on and all this stuff about Tate blew up. And then I'm like, you know, I, I look more and more and more into some of the things he said 
and the more stuff of his that I see, the worse it gets. <laughs> At first, I was like, well, maybe I'm wrong about him. Let me just, you know, let me be open-minded and listen to more of his content and just see what kind of stuff is he really teaching men. You know, you can't expect a guy to be perfect. Of course, some of the stuff you might agree with, some stuff you might disagree with, you know, that, that's kind of a, a typical teacher in any field might be that way. Even in spirituality, you can find a teacher where it's like, yeah, I agree with some stuff. I, I don't agree with other stuff. And, you know, it's just a... Tomato, tomato, difference of opinion, difference of perspective, chalk it up to that, and so what? Let's move on. Uh, but the more I saw uh, Tate's attitude towards business, towards his customers, towards his girls, uh, the worse and worse and worse it got. So we're going to talk about all this, and we're going to connect a lot of different dots, so just, you know, <laughs> get comfortable, grab a drink, uh, and let's just riff on this topic. I shot an episode about five years ago called A Rant Against the Pickup Community. I was involved in the pickup community for a long time, and I saw a lot of shady activity and unethical behavior within the pickup community. I saw a lot of misogynistic attitudes towards women, a lot of abusive attitudes, a lot of exploitation, manipulation, rape, and this kind of stuff. And so... From all those experiences that I had in the pickup community over the years, you know, I, I shot that episode. It's a bit dated now, but still, all those points still basically apply today to what Andrew Tate is doing. And in fact, if you're experienced with this um, field and you kind of know the dating field, the manosphere, the manosphere field, um, the manosphere includes red pill, black pill, you know, maybe incel ideology, the MGTOW movement this kinds of stuff. Um, really, some of these require their own episode, like incel and black pill requires their own episode. Here, we're mostly focusing on sort of the more pickup oriented, Tate oriented, red pill sort of oriented. And the biggest difference between these two, I would say is that the black pill and the incel community, these people are in such a victim mindset, they're so pessimistic and nihilistic that they don't even believe they can be successful with girls. That's very toxic and problematic, and we can help those people in a future episode that I've been meaning to shoot for a while now. But uh, but then there's the, the other sort of spectrum of the manosphere. You know, the manosphere sort of divides into two. Those who are complete victims and believe they can never be successful with women, and so they just bitch and moan and get depressed about it and maybe even get suicidal and so forth. And there's a whole ideology that comes with that. And then... It also bifurcates in the other direction are those men who are not having the success with women that they want. They feel entitled to sex and beautiful women and wealth and cars and this kinds of stuff. Uh, but unlike the black pill and incels, these guys are these guys are, are sharks and they are willing to work for it. And when they get their hands on some of this kind of techniques and advice within business, within dating and so forth, they take it to 11, they have absolutely no ethical standards, they go balls to the wall, and all they care about is maximum sex, maximum beauty, maximum money, damn any costs, or anyone who gets in their way. And so these tend to be the two extremes. And both are really unfortunate. And it can seem like with all you know these various subcultures that exist online, these, these ideologies, these manosphere ideologies, I call them subcultures, um, you can get lost because you see one of them is toxic, so you might go to the, to the other one, but then the other one is toxic, so you go back to the other one, it's like, well, well, where do I, where do I find a healthy mix? Because surely there must be a way that I can have success with women, I can date, I can flirt around, I can socialize, I can get a girlfriend, Maybe if you want multiple girlfriends, you can maybe even do that in an ethical way. Some way, there must be a way to do that in a healthy way, right? And likewise, if you're going to go into business, there must be a healthy way of doing business. It can't all just be scams and get-rich-quick schemes and stuff like this, right? So what's the healthy way of doing this? Well, that's what we're going to be talking about. And don't worry, because in this episode, I'm not just going to be bashing on these various subcultures and then leaving you with no action plan and no healthy solution going forward. I definitely want to provide you with healthy solutions and they do exist. And in fact, I have a whole series. I have a three part series called how to get laid part one, part two, part three, where I go into meticulous detail over 10 hours, completely free 
explanations of my top advice and experience and tips and techniques that I've learned working with some of the best coaches in the world and going to some of the best nightclubs in the world, trying all this stuff out myself, seeing what works, what doesn't work, and listening to their stories and learning from their life experience and all of their mistakes. Very, very deep experience I have there. Very few people have that kind of experience who are also experienced with spiritual and psychological topics, right? So I offer sort of a unique um, combination of these various strands that you usually won't find. Usually when you find a coach within the manosphere, he's just going to be this like pickup coach. Or you find some sort of business coach, you know, he just teaches you like Ty Lopez, just like business advice, shitty business advice, and so on. And they don't connect that with actually creating a great life for yourself, which is my forte, which I can really help you with. So there is a wise way of going about constructing your life as a young man, and then there's a foolish way of doing this. The foolish way is falling for these various kinds of easy ideological bubbles and echo chambers that exist right now on social media. Andrew Tate created one such e echo chamber, but you know, Red Pill is another one that existed long before him. Black Pill, Incel, Pickup, RSD used to be very popular uh, in that way before it collapsed with Julian Gate. In fact, when I released that episode five years ago about the, it was, actually it was more than five years ago, it was more like six or seven years ago now, it was probably back in 2015 that Julian Gate happened. Right around that time I released my episode, uh, a rant against the pickup community. And um, I got a lot of hate actually for that from the within the pickup community. Many of my friends who were in the pickup community saw that episode and they fucking hated me for it. <laughs> to this day, when people, you know, I go out in Vegas, I bump into a lot of random pick, pickup guys in Vegas. To this day, people will see me, um, you know, in the club who are really into pickup and they'll say, oh, I know you, you're from that, from that rant video. So I still get shit for that. Um, and the reason that is, is because I said some really harsh truths in that episode that are going to shake any serious pickup artist to their core. Because there's some deep flaws within pickup. And the flaws are not that it doesn't work. <laughs> the flaws are the lack of, of ethical guidance. Um, the lack of any kind of ethics that exists in that, in that field. Which is extremely unfortunate. And actually, it makes pickup look bad. It makes it such that I don't even want to be associated with that field because of how, how toxic and immature and juvenile it is. Uh, well, almost all of those criticisms that I laid out all those years ago apply directly to, to what Tate and um, his community is, is doing now. Um, in fact, really, if you want to look at it, Tate is almost like RSD 2.0. After RSD collapsed, after Julian Gate in 2015, Julian got canceled. There's a big, um, there, there's, there's a big blow up in the media about that. He was on CNN and all this kinds of stuff. And basically he was caught um, behaving like an asshole to women, ridiculing and sort of like um, behaving very misogynistically towards women. And rightly so, he was canceled. But right before that happened, I attended RSD World Summit, which is a giant convention that they held in Vegas every August. Uh, RSD did, and there were hundreds of, of the best PUAs from around the world flew to that convention. I was at that convention. Uh, this was the year before Julian Gate happened. And the kinds of stuff that I saw going around that room at that time was so toxic, so misogynistic, that I was there, I was just there because I wanted tips for how to like learn how to be better with women. But that's not what they were teaching. I mean, they were teaching that, sure. But then they were teaching stuff that was way beyond that, completely gratuitous, completely unnecessary. I remember Julian sitting there on his laptop in the middle of the convention and people were coming up to him and asking him like, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm just texting with some of my girlfriends. You know, I got like three different girlfriends from LA the other weekend that I just picked up and I got their phone numbers. I slept with them and here I am. I'm pitting them against each other. I'm manipulating this one to think that that one loves me more and I'm trying to get her to fight with the other one so that they're fighting over me. I, 
I'm standing there listening to him explaining all this with a big smile on his face and all the guys standing around there also smiling, thinking this is cool somehow. I'm standing there, I'm thinking like, <laughs> that's not why I came here. I came here for like how to improve my results with women. I don't want to pit women against each other and play these stupid manipulation games. Then he was showing videos of him in Japan taking women off the street in Japan, taking their their, their head and bending their, their faces down towards his crotch just for self-amusement purposes. Completely unnecessary. This, this doesn't help you to get laid. This doesn't help you to get a girlfriend. Completely unnecessary. Completely gratuitous. Completely misogynistic. Um, completely juvenile. And I wanted nothing to do with that. And it was after that convention that I decided to record that rant against the pickup community, and which, which is what I did. Um, that's what inspired me to record that. And then after that, Julian got canceled. Not because of me, because of the shit he did, it leaked out to, to the whole world. And rightly so, he got canceled for that. Um, so, of course, what Andrew Tate is doing is, in a certain sense, even worse. It's like RSD 2.0, like the dark side. <laughs> RC was not as bad as, as some of the stuff that Andrew Tate is accused of. Uh, so what is Andrew Tate really accused of? And it really, at this point, it's beyond accusation. Because see, in a normal situation when some public figure is accused of something, I usually stay out of it. I don't like to be one of these reactive YouTube content creators who's reacting to this little thing and that little thing there and here, you know, nitpicking stuff just for, for clicks and content. That's not why I do this. Uh, I very rarely shoot videos about individuals trying to debunk people and so forth. I, I don't do that. I don't like to do that. I like to do my own original work. But in this case, I felt like uh, I can really offer some guidance to those of you men who are trying to figure out your sense of direction in life. Fundamentally, that's what this is about. How to learn to be a man in a healthy way rather than a toxic way. I can really help you with that. So stick with me. We're building up to it. Um, but in the case of Andrew Tate, the problem isn't even what the girls have accused him of. Because you might say, well, Leo, you know, why are you taking the side of the girls? You know, a couple of girls came uh, around and said that he raped them or whatever, or sex trafficked them. But, you know, that's just, it's their word against his word. And why would you trust the girls over, the, over Andrew Tate? That's not the thing. What I'm listening to is I'm listening to Andrew Tate himself. I'm listening to his demeanor. I'm listening to his ego. I'm listening to his life philosophy and to his attitude towards not just women, but men and life in general. Right? That's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at his stage of ego development. I've studied human psychology for so long <laughs> and so thoroughly. I have a, such a profound understanding of how the ego functions that I can, I can listen to a guy talk for five seconds and immediately understand his level of maturity, development, spiritual, psychological, moral, all of this immediately, instantly. It's, it's so easy. It's so obvious. But when you're new to this field, when you're just a young man who's young, dumb, full of cum, you're horny, you're desperate, you want results with girls, you want a fast car, you want some quick money, you want to get in on some crypto scheme, right? You just want a quick result. When that's your attitude, you're not reading all these subtle signals. It's taken me a decade or more of studying this stuff really deeply to understand human psychology and how my own ego works to, to see how it works in other people. So... It's not about what the girls say about Tate, although, of course, they have said some very damning things, which speak for themselves. And I see no reason to, to doubt the girls. But just listen to what Andrew Tate says about what he does and why he does what he does. According to his own words, he was a professional kickboxer. He earned $70,000 from that. Of course, you don't earn a lot of money. You don't earn tens of millions of dollars in kickboxing. So what do you do? Well, you're a young, ambitious guy. You want a lot of girls. You want fast cars. You want money. And you want it fast and easy. How do you get that? Well, in the real world, there is no way to get that. In the real world, to earn even a million dollars ethically, honestly, is very challenging if you're starting from nothing. Now, he didn't start from nothing. He had 70000 which is pretty good. But still, it's not easy in the real world to convert $70,000 into a million dollars or let alone $10 million quickly within just a couple of years. It's almost impossible to do that unless you're doing something very shady or highly unethical or downright illegal. Almost impossible to do that. Money doesn't come that easily in the real world. 
You need serious skills, serious talent to do that. Kickboxing is not going to get you that. How do you do it? Well, according to his own words, he needed money fast to get to Thailand. So what did he do? He got the bright idea to go gamble. He $70,000 was not enough to buy himself a place in Thailand that he wanted to buy. So he thought, you know, hey, I can go gamble and quickly win. I don't know how much he needed, 100 grand or something. Quickly win 30 extra grand through gambling. Instead, what happened is that he lost 30 grand through gambling. So now instead of 70, he had what? 40. And that's, of course, exactly what happens when you go gamble. So just the fact that a, a person would win $70,000 and then think that he will go buy a house in Thailand by gambling with $70,000 to get $100,000, that alone right there just tells you his level of development and maturity, how his whole mind and philosophy works. See, uh, a serious business person would never do that. A person who works hard for their money would never do that. Because it's obvious you're going to lose. But never mind, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a minor thing, you know. Nothing wrong with gambling. If you want to gamble, go gamble. That's fine. Although, I mean, it is foolish. <laughs> you're a fool if you gamble. I've lived in Las Vegas for 10 years. I haven't gambled a single time. I have had a single drink in 10 years in Vegas. Is it hard for me? To, to not gamble <laughs> and not drink in Vegas? No, it's very easy. I've never even been tempted to. Never even been tempted to. It, ne it never even crossed my mind once in 10 years to do it, to try it. Because when you reach a certain level of cognitive maturity and understanding of how society and the world works, how business works, how money works, uh, you're not tempted by these things. When you understand how health works, you're not tempted to drink. See? This is not something I have to hold myself back <laughs> from. Um, but anyways, so yeah, so he, so he gambled some of that away. And then what did he do? Then he, had, then he says he became a drug dealer. When someone tells you they become a drug dealer, that tells you everything you need to know about their character right there. Just, just that one fact tells you everything you need to know about that character. Never, ever do business with a character like that. One of the hugest red flags, if you find out that one of your business partners or friends or buddies who you hang out with used to be a drug dealer or still is a drug dealer, that's an immediate red flag to tell you never to do business with that person ever again in your life and to get him out of your life as quickly as possible. Now, you might say, well, isn't that unfair? I mean, aren't there some people who used to sell drugs and now they're reformed and they become rappers or they've become actors or whatever? You know, what's wrong with selling a little weed here and there on the side? Who are you to judge? After all, Leo, I mean, like, you talk about psychedelics. <laughs> There's a big difference between smoking some weed or doing some psychedelics versus using drug dealing as a way to make your way through the world. And I'm not saying that you can't redeem yourself. I very much believe that anyone can redeem. I, I, I believe that even a murderer can redeem himself. In theory. Now, in practice, do they? No. In practice, I would never bet on it. And same with a drug dealer. The kinds of mindsets that you need to enter drug dealing in the first place and to be successful at it, because you're dealing with very shady characters, you're basically dealing with the bottom of the barrel of human society when you're talking about drug dealing. Um, your customers are going to be the bottom of the barrel. And in order to deal with those customers... Not to get robbed by those customers. So you got to be at their sort of level. See? You can't be a nice guy drug dealer. That's not how it works. So he did that for some amount of time. And who knows how long he did that. I suspect he might have done that longer than he lets on. But anyways, let's give it to him. Let's say he only did it for a year and then he moved on beyond that. Well, that's still a red flag. Then from there, he says that he had four girlfriends because he would travel around the world. He had four girlfriends all over the world, different parts, and none of them knew about each other. Already red flag right there. If you have a guy friend who has four girlfriends, none of whom know about each other, that's a huge red flag. Why is that? Not because you can't have multiple girlfriends. That's not the reason. The reason is because in order to maintain that 
dynamic, you have to be lying to them all the time. Because, you know, your girl's going to ask you like, oh, baby, let's, let's go out this weekend. And you say, well, I can't. And she'll say, well, why not? And you have to say, oh, well, because, you know, uh, I'm flying to Thailand or something for a, a competition. But actually, you're flying to Thailand to have sex with your other girlfriend, right? So it becomes this web of lies. That's the problem. The problem isn't the cheating itself per se, it's the lying that comes along with it. And whenever there's cheating, there's always lying. Now, Andrew Tate might say something like, oh, Leo, but I don't even consider it cheating. You know, I'm just this abundant guy and I just deserve to have multiple girlfriends. And if they don't like it, they can leave. All right, that's fine if you wanted to play it that way, but that's not how he plays it. The way he plays it is he lies to these girls to get them hooked first, right? See, you hook the girl first by getting her to fall in love with you. Then you tell her that you have other girlfriends. That's a very different situation than if you came up to a girl at the bar and said, hey, you know, you're cool. Let's flirt a little bit. And then she asks you, so, so like, tell me about yourself. And you say, yeah, you know, I got three other girlfriends. If you told her that up front and she heard it and then understood it and said, okay, well, that's fine. I'm cool with that. And then she wanted to be your fourth girlfriend. No problem. No problem. Go for it. Have as many girlfriends as you want. The problem is that it never works that way. Because no self-respecting girl would enter that kind of situation knowingly. These girls have to be tricked into it. They have to be manipulated and deceived into it. And then the way that girl psychology works, that once you have sex with a girl, multiple times she falls in love with you, she thinks she is your number one girlfriend. Uh, and then you drop it on her that, oh no, she's just you know the fourth one. <laughs> well, now she's hooked. She's already got feelings for you. And she might start to rationalize in her mind saying to herself stuff like, well, you know, but you know, we have this special connection. Those other girls, they probably, he probably doesn't care about them. I can, maybe I can convert them to like fall in love with me and we can run off and get married or whatever. And a guy like Andrew Tate, I wouldn't put it past him at all to actually not just not help to disabuse her of those notions, but actually feed into those notions. That's what this whole lover boy method is, right? So there's messages of him telling you guys who follow him how to do this kind of stuff yourself. The, the, the bad part about this is not just that he did this stuff, it's that he's teaching you how to do the same thing. All of this is deeply toxic dysfunctional, unconscious, egotistical, narcissistic, unhealthy, sociopathic behavior. Andrew Tate is a sociopath. You understand that, right? That's what he is. Look at how he behaves, not just towards his girlfriends, not just towards the girls who work for him in his webcam business, but even his customers and clients or the the guys who do business with his webcam girls. He has no concern whatsoever for their well-being. He actively manipulates and teaches the girls in his webcam business how to extract as much money as possible from these poor desperate guys, these lonely guys who are paying, you know, a couple hundred bucks to see this naked girl on the webcam, but then these girls start promising them dates and even getting married and falling in love and all this kind of stuff. And then these guys wire over tens of thousands of dollars their entire life savings. Andrew Tate is on record explaining that this is his method. I'm not making this up. I'm not putting words in his mouth. He teaches this method at Hustler University. So that's a huge red flag right there. When your business hinges upon extracting the life savings of poor, desperate, lonely guys. That means you don't care about your customers. Those are his customers. That's a sociopathic attitude. Now, he would say in defense that, well, you know, Leo, these are poor, desperate, lonely guys. You know, if, if they're willing to give their money away to some, some dumb girl in Romania, you know, that's on them. But, the, but this kind of gaslighting, you see, this kind of gaslighting where you blame the victim for scamming him, blaming him for being stupid, for falling for your scam. This is, I mean, this is, you're not being, this is not any kind of intelligent defense of anything. 
that nobody is falling for this excuse. This is ridiculous. So anyways, Andrew Tate had four girlfriends around the world. He didn't have a webcam business yet, but then he got the idea of like, you know, he, he says this, he sat down in a room, locked himself in a room and said, how do I make a bunch of money as fast as humanly possible? I'm not leaving this room until I figure out a way to make a bunch of money quickly because he needed money. First of all, a guy who does that and puts himself in that situation, already you know that whatever business money making scheme he comes up with, this is not gonna be a good ethical scheme because there is no way to just make hundreds of thousands of dollars overnight with no skills. The world doesn't work this way. The only way to make that kind of money is through some kind of scamming, exploiting, lying, cheating, deceiving, theft, fraud. These are the only ways to do that. So he came up with a scheme because he's like, well, you know, I got four girlfriends. Why don't I use them? They're valuable. They're worth a lot. Hot, hot girls are valuable, right? So he devises a scheme to bring all these four girls, fly them over into Romania. Because um, according to him, you know, in Romania, the, the rape laws are a lot more lenient in Romania. <laughs> when you ask your friend, hey, you know, you live in a first world country, you live in the UK or you live in America, or you could live in America. No, nothing's really stopping. You got the money to live in America. Successful guy. Why do you live in Romania? And your friend tells you, well, because the rape laws are laxer in Romania. Do I even need to present any more of a case? If a man tells you that, that immediately tells you his character. Don't you see that? What we're talking about here is we're talking about character. We're talking about integrity. That's the core issue here. Earlier, I talked about this issue of ethics and you might say, well, Leo, ethics, you know, what, what do I care about ethics? Ethics is like for, for lawyers and accountants and people in government and universities. I'm just, I'm just a guy who wants to bang some girls and drive a fast car. I don't care about ethics. Don't teach me about ethics, teach me about how to bang women. But here's the thing, you're being too myopic. What we're really talking about here is we're talking about how to be a great man, how to be a strong man, how to become a successful man. A huge part of being a strong, great, successful man is integrity and character. That's where the ethics comes in. Believe it or not, you cannot develop yourself into a great, happy, fulfilled, solid human being when you do it on a foundation of lying, deception, fraud, manipulation, controlling others, manipulating people, and uh, cheating and stealing, and coercion, and other kinds of unethical behavior. See, so ethics is a huge thing. It's a lot bigger than you think. It's a lot bigger than anybody in the manosphere teaches you about. Character. If you really want to be a solid man, first and foremost, what you need is character. For a man, and this might actually sound somewhat misogynistic, me saying this, but nevertheless, I think it's true. For a man, character is more important than it is for a woman. Now, that does not mean that for women, they, have, they get licensed to, to cheat and steal and lie and do unethical things. No, ethics, of course, women also need to be ethical. And I believe women also need to develop good character. And in the future, I'll, I'll have episodes that talk about how to develop good character. I'll also have an episode explaining how to uh, specifically assess, very quickly assess good versus bad character. Because this will make and break your whole life right here. Your ability to identify bad characters. Because throughout your life, you will run into psychopaths, sociopaths, people with mental illnesses, scammers, swindlers, cheaters, thieves, drug dealers, rapists, criminals, perhaps even murderers. You're gonna run into all these kinds of people eventually throughout your life. Now, you may not know it consciously. It might take you a long time to discover that those people were, you know, these dark, shady, low integrity characters, but oftentimes, by the time you discover it, if you're slow on the uptake, if it takes you a year or two to figure that out, 
If it takes you a year or two to figure out that your business partner is a sociopath or that your best friend is a rapist or something like that, this might already be so late that it's going to lead to the destruction of your life. Because you do become the average of your friends and the people you surround yourself with. If you surround yourself with uh, low integrity characters, rapists, swindlers, cheaters, thieves, liars, you're going to become acclimated to that kind of subculture. You're going to take it as the norm and then you're going to operate that way. And then your whole life will go down the toilet. And it'll your life will be destroyed before you even know what happened. So this is crucial here. This is crucial. When you're building your success within personal development, and that's really what we're talking about here. The things that Andrew Tate is teaching to those of you young men who find it appealing, he's basically introducing you to a form of personal development. However, it's a very juvenile, immature, toxic form of personal development. There are many different kinds of personal development out there. This is my specialty. I've studied all the different modalities that exist out there. Um, some of them are mature, some of them are immature. Some of them are downright toxic and disgusting. And so you have to be careful what kind of personal development you're gonna be doing. And whenever you're being promised within personal development quick results, this is a huge red flag. Because the reality of personal development, the way that I like to do personal development, my whole ethos with actualize.org is that I teach a very slow, patient, methodical, lifelong commitment to personal development, to the most genuine personal development that you can do that will take you to the highest levels because it's like we're building a skyscraper. When you're building a skyscraper, you need a rock solid foundation. And so this is why I'm stressing the foundation so much. It might seem like, well, Leo, come on, let's get to the, you know, let's get to the meat of the topic. Let's get to the skyscraper itself. Let's put the facade on the skyscraper and the facade on the skyscraper in this case would be like, Leo, tell me about the hot girls with big tits and the, the nightclubs and how to get them. Tell me how to make money online, passive income, easy, fast, right? This would be the facade. And this is what popular social media influencers will try to lure you in with, is with this kind of stuff. This is the sort of like Dan Bilzerian nonsense that you see on Instagram, on TikTok, you know, some buffed up dude who's full of steroids and plastic surgery there, uh, surrounded with 20 hot Instagram models in some tropical pool somewhere in the Bahamas or whatever on a cruise ship and then they're all smiling and looking at like they're having fun. And he looks rich and he has a cigar in his mouth and he's wearing some cool clothes. And there's a Lamborghini parked behind him and he's, you know, he's blowing rings and light, uh, uh, with up smoke and lighting his cigar with $100 bills. This kind of shit. And he's wearing a gold chain. This is the facade of personal development. This is the facade of success. This is not actually how you create wealth. This is not how you create success with, with women. This is not how you become good at attracting women or creating deep loving relationships. This is not how you do business. This is nonsense. This is designed for fucking fools. This kind of advertising, it lures you in. You have to be extremely careful with how social media works. There are a lot of eco, uh, ideological eco, echo chambers that are being constructed within social media these days, which are almost cult-like in the way that they program and play on your mind and they feed on your basest instincts. In this case, as a man, your reptilian brain. So what people like a Dan Bilzerian or a Ty Lopez or a, um, Andrew Tate uh, will do when they advertise to you and they, they recruit followers is what they do is it's very simple what they do. They're not doing anything intelligent at all. They're just finding the deepest parts of your reptilian brain. And then they're, they're, they're finding ways to quickly stimulate that and to give you promises to that reptilian, to that reptilian brain. So what is that as a guy, you know, I could, I could do this. I know, I know all the methods that they use to do this. I don't do it. I have to hold myself back from doing it, but I could do it. You know, I could shoot a TikTok video that will, that will, you know, start pitching things to you like, um, oh, uh, are you a, a desperate, lonely guy who isn't getting good results with women? 
It's those feminists and those social justice warriors. They're the problem. Let me show you how to take back, you know, your culture and your manhood, how to become strong again and how to stick it to those social justice warriors and those, um, you know, those snowflakes and how to get hot, hot girls and get access to the most exclusive nightclubs for free, not pay for, for bottles of champagne. Girls will be buy, buying you bottles of champagne. And you'll be walking in the club with 10 girls around you. And then more girls will be flocking towards you. And you'll be having threesomes and orgies. And your friends will be looking up to you. And the bouncer in the club will be bowing to you when you're walking in there. And then you're going to have a fast car. And you're going to make business connections. You're going to make lots of money through some sort of, you know, crypto pump and dump scheme. This is nonsense. This is not how you create genuine success. If you fall into schemes like these, it's actually going to take you longer to become wealthy and to have success with women. That's the reality of it. I want to save you from that. Personally, for me, one of the things that pisses me off the most is when I'm interested in doing serious personal development or serious spirituality or serious business. And I want serious results. And then what I get is I get pitched surface level, shallow, flaky solutions that even if they work, they're going to work for a month or two and then they're going to all collapse. They're not sustainable. See, when I'm building my life, I want 100% sustainability with everything I build. That means if I attract a girl, I want her to fall in love with me and stick around with me for the rest of my life if I so desire. Not that I just have sex with her once and then she finds out that I'm a fraud and then she runs away. Or that, you know, you might say, well, Leo, what's wrong with the Dan Bilzerian lifestyle? <laughs> it's like, he pays those girls. <laughs> he pays those girls to be there. You think those girls are there? They, they would be there if he didn't pay them? And the only reason he can pay them is because you're watching his stupid fucking pictures and videos and he's getting money from you. So he's taking the money from you and paying it to the girls to create pictures to show to you. <laughs> it's just, it's like a pyramid scheme, you see? And you're feeding into it. You're the bottom rung of this py pyramid scheme. And he's the top. You might say, well, Leo, but surely if he's got all these hot girls around him, he's fucking some of them, right? I'm sure he is. I don't doubt that. First of all, he's a good looking dude. Uh, second of all, yeah, when you got all this money throw around and you host all these parties because you got all this money from all these followers, and you're paying all these girls. Yeah, of course. These girls, a lot of these girls are very materialistic and you buy them uh, champagne for $1,000 and they'll fuck you. Yeah, of course. <laughs> but you got to ask yourself, is that the kind of love you want in your life? Is that the kind of girl you want? First of all, are you the kind of guy that can afford to spend thousands of dollars on having sex with a girl just once? Personally, for me, that's not, I don't, I'm not going to pay $1,000 to sleep with a girl once. To me, that's a ripoff. <laughs> I value my own money more than that. <laughs> they might say, well, Leo, you're just not wealthy enough. If you had $100 million, you wouldn't care about spending $1,000 to have sex once. Okay, but you're talking about prostitution there. If, if you want prostitution, you know, that's the easiest thing in the world. Go to Vegas. You can go to Vegas any night, walk into any casino, and you can hire a girl for under $1,000 to have sex with you. You don't need Dan Bilzerian or uh, whoever, Andrew Tate, to teach you how to do that. That takes zero skill. It takes money. Um, which of course you don't have. And the methods that these people are trying to teach you for how to get money and the methods they themselves use for how to get money, these are unsustainable methods. See, Andrew Tate's methods of earning money himself. I don't even mean his thousands of, of, of dumb customers who will never earn anything. 99% of people who try to earn money through Tate's methods will earn zero. In fact, they will lose their money. I guarantee you. I... I've, I've deeply studied all these methods and techniques. It's, this is how it works. Uh, Andrew Tate is not teaching you how to do genuine business of any kind. He himself is not running a genuine business. He wouldn't know how to run a genuine, legitimate, ethical business. He's teaching you ways of how to scam. In fact, it's very, it's very interesting because Andrew Tate's ego, beyond being a narcissist, he's, I mean, beyond being a, uh, a sociopath, he's also obviously a narcissist because his ego is just so fucking massive that he brags to you all about all the unethical things that he's doing. I mean, it, it's really very unintelligent when you think about it. <laughs> um, but his ego is so massive that he doesn't even 
feel ashamed for this unethical stuff that he does, which is why he brags about drug dealing and tax evasion and, uh, and trafficking girls and scamming his, his clients and so forth. Um, the reality is that Tate's business itself is not a sustainable business. The only reason he's earning that money is because he's, he's doing tax evasion. He's exploiting women, which we'll talk more about that more with, with these webcam, with this webcam model. He's literally doing sex trafficking um, and taking more than half their money, lying to them about it. He's also scamming and exploiting the customers who are these girls' customers. He's taking a bunch of tens of thousands of dollars from them, scamming them, not paying tax on any of that because he's getting it through Bitcoin. Um, and, um, and then in addition to that, there's allegations and he himself has made allusions to various other kinds of um, money laundering that he does. Who knows where money is coming from? Could be from the mob, could be from other illegal activity. Who fucking knows? There's that going on. And then, of course, he gets money from his Hustler University um, uh, affiliate marketing scheme. Uh, but that's been shut down. And the only reason that that, that works is because he got high in, on social media. Right. This is this is he's he's a flash in the pan. This is not a legitimate business. You see, he's not going to have a bunch of happy customers. But anyways, what I was saying about Hustlers University, you know, it's uh, it's illustrative that he named his business course Hustlers University. I encourage you to go Google up a, the dictionary definition of what a hustler is. What is a hustler? Look it up in the dictionary. A hustler is a otherwise known as a con artist or a swindler, one who um, makes his way through the world through deceit and manipulation. That's literally the definition of a hustler. And that's exactly what he's teaching you. That's what Andrew Tate is. He's a hustler. <laughs> this is not a good thing. <laughs> you don't want to be friends with a hustler. See, what you have to understand about sociopaths is that they use people transactionally. They don't care about anyone. They don't have any empathy. Andrew Tate doesn't care about you. He's using you. He's using all of you young, dumb guys out there who are horny and desperate. In the same way that he's himself has admitted, he's admitted doing this with his webcam customers. So not only does he use the girls, he also uses the guys, right? It's not, you might think, oh, you might say, but Leo, Andrew Tate is fighting against the Matrix and he's fighting against the feminazis and he's fighting against the, the sort of like the LGBTQ community and all those, you know, stage green people and those hippies. He's fighting against all that to defend men's rights. No, he's not doing that. He doesn't have integrity to do that. You see, to actually fight for men's rights against the feminazis and so forth, this would take character and integrity, which he doesn't have enough development to rise to the level to have. See, that's the problem when you deal with low integrity people is that you think that, oh, well, you know, I have a low integrity friend who steals from everybody else and he cheats on all his girlfriends, but I'm his friend, I'm his best friend. So the money he steals, he's gonna share it with me and we're gonna be, it's gonna be great, right? No, this is so naive. You're being so myopic because that sociopathic friend of yours who's cheating and lying and stealing, what do you think he's going to do when it comes to you? As soon as it's convenient for him, he's going to treat you just as transactionally as he treated all his girlfriends, all his customers that he scammed. He's going to do the same thing to you. That's the problem. There's no honor among thieves. So when you guys think you can get together as Hustlers University and all of you together by copying this low integrity, low character um, philosophy, all prosper together and bring down the matrix. No, <laughs> because you guys are a bunch of scammers, hustlers and thieves who are all going to be scamming, hustling each other first and foremost, backstabbing each other. And the whole thing is going to collapse. That's why ethical organizations and ethical practices are so core to the functioning of society. It's not that there's a bunch of squares within government and mainstream media and the matrix, as he likes to say, that are, you know, they're all buttoned up and ethical and, you know, they are the system and we got to fight the system. No. 
Andrew Tate doesn't care about fighting the system. Nor do most of his followers. All they care about is what hooked them in in the first place, which is that stimulus to your reptilian brain that tells you that you're going to get girls with hot, big tits, and fast cars and easy money. That's what you're really after. And you don't care about challenging the system. You don't care about reforming society. You don't care about democracy or egalitarianism or making society more fair or equitable law and justice. You don't care about any of that, if you're honest. These are maybe just a facade you have. What you care about is a thing that hooked you in, in the first place, into this scheme, which is fast money, easy sex. Easy power and status. An easy sense of security in the world. See, that's another aspect of this thing. It's like, and Andrew Tate preys on your lack of security as a man. You feel insecure. You feel like you don't have big enough muscles. You feel like you're not tall enough. You feel like you're not confident enough. You don't project your voice enough. You're not assertive enough. And Andrew Tate, you know, he has some of these qualities. I'm not denying that. Is he confident on camera? Yes. Is he charismatic? Yes. Is he a good speaker? Yes. Does he know how to articulate his points? Yes. Is he a good chess player? Yes, is maybe a decent kickboxer. Yes, I guess he's a decent fighter, de decent boxer. All of those things may be true, but that has nothing really to do with one's development, one's character, one's consciousness, and also one's ability to be happy, to maintain loving relationships, to attract women in a healthy manner. There's a very big difference between attracting a woman to just to sleep with her once or twice versus actually developing a deep relationship with a woman who will respect you. That's night and day difference. We're going to talk about that more in a bit. Let's get back to the, to the story that Tate himself described. So um, I sort of left it off where he had four girlfriends. He flew them all to Romania. And then they said, and then, and then he sat them all down at the table and said, you're all my girlfriends. They didn't even know that. <laughs> Each one of them thought she was the only one. Okay, now they're all four sitting there at the table already. That's a very scumbag move to do. He did that, but then to add insult on top of injury, um, then he tells them that he's starting this webcam business and that now they can sit for eight hours a day uh, with their panties off, showing their pussy to, to the whole world. Now, let me ask you. Is that your idea of how to treat a woman right? Let's say that you have a woman that you really value and appreciate. She's beautiful. She's your girlfriend. You two make passionate love together. She might be the mother of your children. Would you propose to that woman to sit for eight hours a day and take her panties off for strangers for money? I mean, this, this is fucking preposterous. This is preposterous. If you think that this is what a, a, a high quality man would ever do. You might say, but Leo, it's not illegal. It, it doesn't matter that it's not illegal. Just offering that idea to a girl is already deeply disrespectful it already shows you that there's something very wrong with your psyche to offer that to a girl. To open the door for someone you love and care about into the sex industry, sex works industry. This is, this is one of the most um, disgusting and unethical things you can do. And you can very easily convince yourself of this very easily with the following simple little thought experiment. If you had a daughter, if you had a daughter that you truly loved, she was your only daughter, you invested 20 years raising this daughter to be a good daughter. And then on her 20th birthday, let's say on her 21st birthday, you know, she's an adult now, you sit her down and you say, hey baby, I got this webcam right here. How about you sit down right here? You're gonna take your panties off for these strangers eight hours a day, five days a week. You're gonna be making great money, $5,000 a week you'll be paid. I'll take half of it, but you'll take the other half. It'll be great. It's totally legal. 
Totally legal. I mean, this is obvious stuff. And yet a lot of Andrew Tate defenders just are too biased to see this. You have to understand that it's difficult for you to understand some of the things that I'm saying because these are disabling the ideology that you want to use in order to get money and sex. Right? If you really are desperate for money and for sex, then you literally can't take in the message that I'm saying here. You literally can't run this thought experiment because you need it to be the case that you can do this with girls. And that is totally normal and okay. Do you understand how psychologically traumatizing it is to a girl to do sex work? How demeaning it is. This is going to ruin her ability to, to make love in the future. This is going to ruin her ability to have a boyfriend and a healthy relationship. This is going to create toxic relationships for the rest of her life. It's the equivalent of abuse. It's mental, psychological abuse. In many cases, not in all cases. If a girl of her own volition really wants to enter the sex work industry, not because she's financially pressured to because she's broke, not because her boyfriend forces her into it, not because some, some pimp for her forces her into it, or somebody tricks her into it, or whatever, but simply because she just wants to express herself sexually. She's really good at it. She loves sex. She just wants to go into it and, and do porn or whatever. Fine. Fine. But I would submit to you that this is a fantasy. The majority of girls don't get into sex work that way. They get into sex work because they're broke, they have no other options, or they're coerced into it by guys. And this traumatizes them for the rest of their life. And to not see that as a guy, the only reason you don't see it is because you're in denial about it, because all you care about is sex. You don't care about the well-being of the girl. Now you might say, well, Leah, why should I care about the well-being of the girl? You know, she doesn't care about my well-being, so why should I care about her well-being? <laughs> We're talking about relationships. Why are you relating with these girls just to have sex with them? You're using them as sex objects. This is one of the first problems with Andrew Tate's whole philosophy. It's obvious from listening to how he talks about his girlfriends and girls in general is that he views girls purely as sex objects, nothing else. That's the only value they hold for him. He views them as disposable and dispensable. He has no respect for them. Not intellectually, not spiritually. And then he'll laugh about it, makes jokes about this kind of stuff. This is deeply problematic and toxic. This is the core of the misogyny. And this is one of the most dangerous aspects of what he's teaching you guys. Is because in the end, as horny as you might be right now, as desperate and lonely as you might be right now, in the end, once you start to date and you start to have some results with girls and you start to have some sex, you'll realize that sex, it's okay, but really, it's never going to fulfill you. It's not that exciting and interesting. It gets old pretty fast. And that really what you want is you don't want just sex. And you're not going to be satisfied with having sex with a girl who then isn't satisfied with you and doesn't like the relationships you two have each other, between each other. So really what it's about, it's about being able to relate on a deeper level with the opposite sex. That's really what you need to learn. And you're starting off your whole world philosophy with this idea that women are just sex objects that you use transactionally and that you can use them to make money if you can or to have sex if you can or throw them away if, if, if they refuse to cooperate. This is the attitude. This is the Andrew Tate attitude. This is a sociopathic attitude towards relationships. You will never have any successful, fulfilling relationships with this attitude, not with women or with men. 
And of course, Andrew Tate doesn't just have this attitude with women, he has it with men. That's the thing, it's not just that Andrew Tate is misogynistic, obviously he is. He's a sociopath. That means he treats men in the same way. It's just that women, men don't have any sexual value to him, so of course he can't pimp them out, and he can't use them that way, but he can use them to make money. He just uses them as, as, as marks for his cons. That's what you are. You're his marks. That's what he does with his webcam customers, who are male. He teaches the girls how to swindle and hustle these poor, desperate, lonely guys, incels and so forth, out of tens of thousands of dollars in their life savings. This is one of the most disgusting things you can do to a man. Imagine a man who truly struggles to get girls. He's never had sex, he's a virgin, he's an incel, he's on the bo he's borderline suicidal. Then he goes on this webcam website, and then you know he sees some naked girls, jerks off, maybe gets a little bit of love from them. Okay, he pays, he pays a couple of grand for that over a course of a month or two. Okay, fine, fine, that's fine. You know, that, that maybe holds him over, makes him feel a little better. Maybe he doesn't even kill himself because of that. But then Andrew Tate teaches these girls who wouldn't otherwise do this, he then teaches these girls how to, how to manipulate this guy, uh, wind him around her finger, and then extract his life savings, $20,000 from this poor guy, with, with promises of meeting up with him for a date and, and being a couple together and getting married and all this kinds of stuff. This is, I mean, this is, this is, this is one of the most low integrity things you can do. You would think that, let's say Andrew Tate was a true men's rights advocate and he really cared about helping men and he really cared about incels and the plight of incels and all this kinds of stuff. And he really wanted to help. Well, he wouldn't be treating his customers this way then. And then he wouldn't be flipping it back around and saying, oh, that, that's their problem. They were just suckers and stupid. No. If you truly cared about men's rights and helping men, then it would be your problem. You would want to help these guys to actually get success with women. For free, even. I release a 10 hour long episode, three, three part series, how to get laid, part one, part two, part three, completely for free, explaining to guys from zero, from scratch, how to get girls. For z I charge zero. I could have charged a thousand dollars. That could have been a whole course. I could have charged a thousand dollars easily. I could have made a couple hundred thousand dollars just selling that episode, that, that three part series uh, to my subscribers. I would have made hundreds of thousands of dollars. Maybe over my lifetime, I could have made over a million dollars just selling that episode. Because it's it's not just theory, it's like techniques, all of my best stuff. I gave it all away for free. Why did I do that? Because I actually care about helping guys with this problem. If you actually cared, you would do that. Rather than trying to suck out their life savings. So Andrew Tate is not interested in helping these guys. He's just interested in using any guys or gals he can to get himself ahead. That's all it is. That's what sociopathy is. It's purely transactional. There's no empathy. There's no concern. There's no loyalty. He expects his girls to be loyal to him, but he has no loyalty at all towards his girls. Classic narcissism. Classic sociopathy. In this respect, he's just like Trump. So anyways, what he himself said is that after he told these four girlfriends of his to do this webcam business, um, two of them left immediately, started crying and left immediately. Those were the two smart girls. Those were the two girls that had self-respect. He broke their hearts, but they left. They knew better than to get involved with this scumbag. They found out his true character right there. Um, the other two girls stayed in Romania and started doing the webcam stuff. One of the girls left a week or two later because she was also wise, she, you know, he, she got over her love and emotions for emotional attachment to him, and then you know she wised up and she re realized the scumbag he is, and she left too. That left him with one girl. That one girl was the least intelligent of all, all those four, the, had the lowest self-esteem, and she was the most desperate and the most foolish, and she stayed 
as part of his uh, sex trafficking organization. He then took her passport and manipulated her and then started recruiting other girls until eventually he recruited dozens and I don't know, over a hundred girls, he says, into this, um, into this operation. He would take their passports, uh, he would coerce them, he would lie to them, he would manipulate them, he would give them fake tax documents to sign, he would, um, he would lie to them about how much money he's giving them. So, you know, he says that they would get a 50-50 split when in fact they had got less than a 50-50 split. He would take more than 50% of the profits himself. And um, fundamentally, the, the, the role that Andrew Tate played in this whole webcam girl business scheme is that he played the role of the middleman. And that's why he was so paranoid and touchy about these girls leaving. He was so controlling and so manipulative about getting these girls to stay. You know, he would text them messages, stuff like, you know, you got to, you know, never go out alone. Anytime you go out, even when you go out to the grocery store from now on, you got to go only with me or with some other man. Why would you ever say that to a girl? Um, unless you were trying to control and manipulate her. And why would you try to do that unless she was your source of revenue and you needed to do that because you knew you were just a leech and a middleman and that as soon as she realized that she could do this webcam business by herself, she didn't need you anymore, she would just leave. And that's exactly what Andrew Tate's greatest fear was because fundamentally he didn't provide very much value. He provided some initial value to these girls in the sense that if they wanted to make a lot of money, he introduced them into this industry. In that sense, you could say he added some value if the girl really wanted to be in the industry. Uh, of course, many didn't, but those who did, okay, fine. So he added some value, but you know, that's sort of like his finder's fee. That's called a finder's fee. Is <laughs> you know, when you introduce somebody into, into some business deal or whatever, you get a finder's fee. That's a one-time fee. You don't keep getting that fee paid over and over again. Of course, Andrew Tate wants a, <laughs> wants a, a, a finder's fee in perpetuity. So he's getting more than half the income of these girls. He's leeching that off them by controlling and manipulating them, making them feel weak and helpless. Uh, in a foreign country, they don't know, they don't have any business connections, they don't have any uh, real money that they can use, um, you know, they don't have many friends, they don't have family, they're isolated, so they just rely on him. And also he makes them fall in love with him, the lover boy method, as it's called. And uh, and so all of that helps to keep this girl around. Let's say by using these, these you know, pressure tactics, various kinds of threats, um, telling the girl that he's gonna beat her or rape her or throw her out on the street, take her passport, all this kind of, all these combined, all these manipulation tactics combined, let's say that the average girl, she gets into his business and she does the webcam stuff for three to six months, earns some good money, but then she either gets tired or quits because she doesn't wanna do it anymore because it's exhausting and it's demeaning, or she says, you know, no, I am gonna keep doing this, but wait a minute, why is Andrew Tate taking half my income? I'm doing all the work and he's still taking half my income six months later, a year later, two years later, he's still taking half my income? This isn't fair. Of course, of course it isn't fair. <laughs> so um, without the pressure and coercion, she would leave after three to six months. But with the pressure, the coercion, all these sorts of manipulation tactics, he keeps her around, let's say, for another year or two. These girls can earn up to $10,000 a month. That's $100,000 per girl. So every girl he can find and pressure and manipulate into sticking around for one extra year beyond what would be the natural cycle, because I, I, I'm, I'm sure that there's a very high attrition rate within the webcam girl industry. Probably your average girl does it for a year or less. So if he is able to use his pressure tactics to manipulate these girls into being in the industry for an extra year, that's an extra $100,000. And he's gonna get half of that. So that's $50,000 per girl, uh, even more because he doesn't pay taxes on it, according to his own admissions. And so um, now let's say he has uh, 100 girls. Times $50,000 a year. That's how you make some serious money. But of course, what's the problem? Well. <laughs> Not only is it deeply, deeply unconscious, uh, low integrity and unethical, it's actually downright illegal in most countries, including Romania. This is called sex trafficking. When you coerce people 
into doing sex work. That's called sex trafficking. There you go. But you might say, well, Leo, no, it's not really sex trafficking. You know, we can, we can, we can argue about the technicalities and argue ultimately that it's not, it doesn't violate the, the, the letter of the law, you might say. Okay, even, even let's say it's not technically sex trafficking. Um, it's still deeply, deeply problematic and unethical. Even worse is that he's having sex with all these girls, so it's also deeply unprofessional. See, it's one thing if like, let's say, there's a difference between me just having a webcam studio with girls. I could set up a webcam studio, very professional, clean. We could have legitimate you know, business contracts that lawyers wrote up. The girls would know that they're getting 50%, I'm getting 50%. I set them up, I introduce them. Maybe they even pay me a finder's fee. You know, They pay me 100% of their salary for the first two months just because I set all this up for them. Uh, Okay, fine. And then they come to work, they do the work, and if they want, they can leave any time, but they're happy because you know, I provide them a nice environment, they earn a lot of money. It's good. You could have a business like that. And that would be professional. But then if I'm also personally having sex with all these girls and manipulating them into thinking that they're falling in love with me and I'm falling in love with them, taking them to dinners and this kinds of stuff, getting them drunk, this is deeply, deeply unprofessional. But this was not just something he was doing because he just wanted to have sex with girls, which of course, who could blame him? But um, this was actually part of his method of control because the deeper he can connect with these girls, the more they can fall in love with him, the more he can get them to promise to be loyal to him, then the longer they stay, you see? So this is all part of the business tactic. If he wasn't doing this, he would be losing millions of dollars in potential revenue. And he says this himself, he said in, in a video clip of his, he said that um, if a girl is not fucking you, she has no, lo no loyalty to you. So if a girl is working for you, let's say I'm the boss, girl is working for me, if I'm not fucking her, she's not gonna be loyal to me, and what I need as the guy, is I need as the boss, I need control over her. I mean, this is as toxic as it possibly can get. When we talk about me too, this is, this is like the most explicit, explicitly the most toxic aspect of Me Too. At most workplaces, when a boss has sex with one of his underling employees, like, you know, boss has sex with a secretary, CEO has sex with a secretary, um, most of those you can sort of excuse, you know? You, you can understand, you know, the boss, the secretary, you know, they're hanging around all the time, they're both attractive, they're lonely, they're single, they fall in love with, you know, they get hot for each other, they have sex, you know, what, what's the big deal? Sure, it's a little bit of a you know imbalanced power dynamic, but you know you can kind of you can kind of understand. You know, a lot of people meet their wife or spouse at work. So what's wrong with that? Well, that's somewhat excusable. Although, of course, in practice, the boss has a lot more. You know, a CEO has a lot more power over the secretary, so he's going to abuse that situation. Um, but in most of those situations, I doubt that the boss is like explicitly using that as a method to keep the, the, the secretary around. <laughs> so imagine how much more toxic it would be if every female employee that enters into the boss's you know, office, he has a plan. This is, like a, a, this is like a script he goes through, is that he will invite this girl over into his office, he will seduce her, make her fall in love with him, and go through all of this, have sex with her and all that, and then get her to promise to be loyal to him all of that just so that she stays a secretary in the office longer than she normally would want to because the you know the work environment there is so awful let's say that you know if he didn't do that she would leave within a month but since he does this lover boy method she's going to stay for a couple extra years just cuz you know she has feelings for him this would be like the most diabolical form of me too um kind of behavior and that, that's exactly Tate's MO here. So this really isn't about Tate. I don't care about Tate. He's really irrelevant. Um, what I want you to see is I want you to see just 
the psychology. What we're talking about here is we're talking about psychology. Everything here is, is all psychology. Also, we're actually talking about spirituality, although that's probably a little too advanced to bring in here. Well, let's just stick with psychology for now. Here's how the psychology of it works. Your reptilian brain wants quick results, quick money, quick sex, quick cars, quick vacations, and so forth. Quick power and status and fame. How do you get that? Well, it's hard to get that through hard work because you'd have to like go to college, get a five-year degree, become a computer programmer, work for 10 years, and only then you'd maybe make a million dollars. That's the legit way to make a million dollars. Well, <laughs> that doesn't appeal to the reptilian brain. The reptilian brain wants some kind of shortcut. So it's looking for a shortcut. So what does it do? It does exactly what Tate did. Is it sits down, it locks itself into a room and says, I'm not leaving this room until I find my shortcut. So of course, the brain is very resourceful. The ego mind is very resourceful at finding shortcuts, manipulating, exploiting. So it looks for ways to exploit and manipulate. And if you have no ethics or morals, this is very easy. Because see, if Tate had ethics and morals and he was sitting in that room and the idea came to him like, well, I could, I could pimp out my girlfriend, my four girlfriends, I could pimp them out on webcams for money. That idea would come and then you say, well, wait a minute, no, that I have to maintain my integrity. That wouldn't be right. I couldn't be a self-respecting man and do that to my girlfriend. So that, that's not gonna file. Let me, let me think about other methods of making money. But see, he didn't do that. He, he was in that room and then as soon as in his mind the idea came, you know, it's like he's flipping through a Rolodex and then the idea comes, oh, I can pimp out my girlfriends for money. Oh, perfect, of course. Why didn't I think of this before? <laughs> perfect, there's no problem here at all. And then he goes and does it. See, this is the psychology behind it. And that psychology comes from a sort of narcissism of believing you can actually get away with this stuff and then it's not gonna come back to bite you. Well, that's one of the lessons you're learning with Andrew Tate. See, one of the best lessons he's taught you is not all the stuff about how to treat women. One of the best lessons he's taught you is he's taught you the lesson of karma. He's taught you the lesson of how egotism boomerangs and backfires on itself. Why do you think mainstream society denounces egotistical behavior? Criminal behavior, sociopathic behavior, misogynistic behavior. Do you think it's because everywhere in mainstream society people are just squares and they just wanna follow the rules just for the sake of following the rules and they just wanna like deny you the goodies, deny you the sex, deny you the uh, the money and the good things in life. No, <laughs> it's because we've already tried this as a society. Thousands of years ago, before we reached our current level of development, we had societies where you were allowed to do sex trafficking, rape, scamming, theft, securities fraud, wire fraud, bank fraud, Ponzi schemes. All of these were legal just hundreds of years ago in most places in the world. And some of these things are still legal today. There's still slavery in the world today in certain places. So um, in the most developed countries like America and the UK, we've outlawed these and we have very strict controls against this. Not only did we outlaw them at the legal level, we also created social stigmas against these kinds of activities. Because it's not merely, you know, a lot of times it's hard to prosecute someone for a rape. Most rapes don't get prosecuted because you need evidence, it's hard to find that evidence to convict, go to a trial, you know, it's very messy. Likewise, you know, many Ponzi schemes don't get prosecuted because you need it's hard to prosecute any crime. You need an overwhelming preponderance of evidence, which is usually not available, or it's too expensive to, uh, to accumulate it all and to gather it all together and to convince a jury beyond a reasonable doubt and so forth. Uh, these trials are very expensive and so forth. So we don't just have legal barriers for these kinds of crimes. We also have social stigmas. We have a social stigma against, for example, um, getting a girl blackout drunk and then having sex with her in your hotel room. We have a stigma against that, 
even though maybe it's not technically illegal, you know, it's going to vary state by state, country by country. But in most cases, you can probably get away with it, although it's kind of a gray area. Um, but even if you get away with it, you wouldn't want to brag about that to your mother. See? Because she thinks you're an awful human being. Um, likewise, we have, we have social stigmas against scams and um, various kinds of frauds and Ponzi schemes that can be run. These need to be in place because much of how human society operates is, you know, pre-legal, at the pre-legal level. Most conflicts in society do not get resolved in the courtroom. They get resolved much, much earlier. Simply through shaming, guilting, canceling people, and so forth. You know, you wonder, you guys who support Andrew Tate, you cry about cancel culture and so forth. What is the function of cancel culture? You have to think about this. The function of cancel culture is to be a sort of a quasi-legal system to handle those cases that the legal system is unequipped to handle or never will handle because it doesn't rise to the level of being handled at the, you know, at the legal level. Like, um, when, a, when a CEO has sex with a secretary and abuses that situation, it may not technically be illegal, but there's a social stigma because we don't want to perpetuate that kind of behavior. Because if every CEO did that with all his secretaries, this would create a toxic work environment that would be bad for everybody. It would be bad for the secretaries, it would be bad for the CEOs too, because you know, all these sex scandals, eventually they all come out, they all blow up. Uh, the CEO loses his reputation. This hurts the, the stock of the company. It's bad for the shareholders. It's, it's bad for the office workers. It's, it's bad for the economy even. It's bad for everybody. It's bad for the customers. It's bad for the families of the people involved, for the children involved in these families who you know are just innocent bystanders. Their lives get destroyed by this kind of stuff. Which is why we have these kinds of social norms and stigmas. Now, does it sometimes go too far? Of course, of course. This is the problem of, of trial by, by um, well, it's not trial, but it's sort of like judgment by mob. This is mob justice. Mob justice is not a very effective way of getting justice, although, you know, sometimes mob justice is the only way justice is done. If the legal system is not working effectively, for example, if the legal system is not effectively prosecuting rapes, then you better believe there's going to be a mob that rises up after a rape at some point because the legal system is not doing its job, so the mob does the job. That's what cancel culture fundamentally is. Now, every cancel culture case has to be judged on a case-by-case -case basis. Some of them are legitimate. Some of them are not legitimate. We're not going to get into those details here, um, but understand why this stuff exists. Understand what the matrix is. <laughs> What Andrew Tate calls the Matrix, what you guys call the Matrix, this is not the real Matrix. This is some bullshit that he invented, um, you know, to ju to justify his crimes. Um, <laughs> the idea that any kind of national government would be threatened or care about Andrew Tate and his stupid little sex traffic operation, <laughs> as as though this would be threatening to the U.S. government, to the to the to the British government or even to the Romanian government. This is fucking laughable. It's laughable. Nobody cares about Andrew Tate. He's not a threat to anybody, to any government, to any elites or anyone in power. <laughs> He's not threatening anybody. <laughs> um, when he says the matrix, all he's really meaning is he's meaning the government. It's like, you know, yesterday I robbed a bank. Guys, the Matrix came for me today because I robbed a bank yesterday, you know. God damn that Matrix. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> that's not the Matrix. That's the government. That's the social contract we have. That's the society we have. We set up rules and ethics so that people can play by these rules so that we don't have chaos. And so that evil doesn't spread like a wildfire through society. So we don't have an epidemic of rape going on. This is very easy to understand. Just consider that you have a daughter. Consider you have an 18 year old daughter. Would you allow your 18 year old daughter to date Andrew Tate? Knowing everything you know about him. This is where the, the rubber meets the road. 
this is where you really get serious about your bias here. Uh, it, if you're any kind of decent father, you would say, hell no. You would not want to let Andrew Tate near your daughter within a mile radius. This is obvious to any father. And if this is not obvious to you, you're just blind because you are you want sex and you're not thinking about daughters and whatever else, you just want sex. If you're a 16 years old, 18 year old guy, horny, desperate, incel, just wants sex with a hot girl, you don't care about any of these concerns. You don't care about society, you don't care about culture, you don't care about the legal system, you don't care about rape, you laugh about rape. Uh, in your mind, you think of it like this, like, well, it would be cool if a girl raped me. So what are these girls crying about? Even if Andrew Tate did rape one of them, so what? You know, if I got raped by a girl, I'd be happy. You're so narcissistically, your worldview is so egocentric that you can't see anything beyond just what your reptilian brain craves right now, which is sex and money. Maybe power. But the rest of society is more evolved than you. It's not that you're smarter than the rest of society. It's not like that the rest of society is some dumb matrix, a bunch of idiots doing a bunch of government stuff, and then they're just holding you back, and then you're like the insurgent, and you're the revolutionary, and you're like Neo in the matrix breaking free. No, 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 no. You are young, dumb, and full of calm. You're so narcissistic and egotistical that you can't even think beyond next month let alone care about larger issues like society, ethics, government, politics, or any of that. None of that fucking matter. Any, any ideas you have about politics, they're all completely twisted by your egocentric mind in order to justify your ability to get sex, money, and power. That's your only understanding of politics. And then you think that everybody else thinks that way too, which they don't. Uh, actually, most people in society, they care about maintaining order and harmony in society. And most people in society are obeying the rules. They're paying their taxes. They're not raping people. And they're doing honest work. They're not defrauding customers and so forth. All right? So it pisses them off when guys like Andrew Tate can earn tens of millions of dollars by just flagrantly flaunting their illegal criminal activity in public and their unethical activity. And then not only do they not get charged or punished for this, they actually get more followers and they get praise and they get worshipers and they almost build up a cult following. This is uh, deeply annoying to those of us who actually work hard for a living, who are ethical and try to do the right things and try to follow the, the norms, you see. It's not that we're following the norms because we're squares and we're not macho enough or man enough to break the rules. We're not, you know, we're just, we're just sheep in the matrix. No, we're not sheep, sheep in the matrix is that we're actually conscious ethical people. Uh, we're mature. We realize that, that breaking these ethical norms is going to create a worse society for everybody. It's going to lead to suffering and that this has nothing to do with creating a better society or creating more equality in the world. It's the opposite of that. It's the opposite. Andrew Tate is not the hero here. Just think about it like this. Think about it from a superhero point of view. Imagine Batman, right? You guys are into superheroes. You know, they're macho, strong Batman, right? So Batman, he, he, he gears up. He puts on his cape and his, you know, his wing bat suit. And he's got all his gadgets and stuff. He's got his awesome car. And, you know, he's driving out there like Andrew Tate. You think, in the morning, Andrew Tate, you know, he puts on his suit his boxing gloves, and he gets in his Bugatti, and then he, you know, he, he drives out to work, right? So what does he do? He drives out onto the street, into a dark corner on some Romanian street. He finds some girl walking down the street, you know, the, the way the Batman would do, you know, save this girl from some rapist in a dark alley. You know, some, some girl's being raped, and he comes in there, and he swoops in with all his fancy technology, and he's fighting for, for freedom and justice against these evildoers. What is Andrew Tate doing? He's putting on his, his fancy suit, his Rolex watch, getting in his Bugatti, driving down the street. I mean, he probably does this online, but let's just say he does it all. He drives down the street. He finds a girl walking down an alley. And then imagine Batman doing this. Batman sees a girl walking down a dark alley and he says, hey, hey, 
Miss, miss, uh, are you interested in a business proposition? Yeah, I got this thing called webcams. Come with me in my Batmobile. I'll drive you to my Batcave. There, I have a hundred other girls like you sitting there eight hours a day masturbating for strangers on the internet and taking all their money. Desperate, lonely strangers. Come with me. We're going to save Gotham City by doing this. We're fighting the Matrix. Together, you and I will fight the Matrix. You'll take half and I'll take half. We'll be partners together against the evildoers of Gotham City. <laughs> it's fucking preposterous, right? Yeah, this is exactly what Andrew Tate is doing. He's not the hero here. He's the criminal. He's the one that superheroes protect us from. And those superheroes, they don't look fancy and flashy like Andrew Tate driving in a Bugatti. You know what those superheroes look like? They look like your average cop on the street who's earning $40,000 a year driving some beat up old cop car. Um, you know, the police chief detective, the lawyer, the district lawyer, or prosecutor who's sitting there all day reading through lists of rape reports, very boring, dry stuff. And then he has to, you know, sit there, write reports on his computer all day. These are the real superheroes. Or the politicians who pass a law that say that having sex with a girl who's blackout drunk is considered rape. The politician who passes that law, he's the superhero. What I want to make you aware of as young, as a young man, here's where we're starting to start to make this more applicable to you. Because you might be wondering, well, Leo, how does this help me? I want to help you to build a solid foundation for that skyscraper that is going to be your character and your development for the rest of your life that you're going to be building. This solid foundation requires you to understand that you cannot build a high quality life in this quick, easy, exciting, testosterone filled, flashy way. All of this flash that is being used to sell you on a business course, a get rich quick scheme, some pickup seminar, some hustler university, some crypto scheme. This is all bullshit. It's all bullshit. It's all flash. You know, they, they sex it up for you. Personally, when I'm looking to a solution for a serious problem in my life, I want a serious solution. I don't want any kind of gimmick, nothing flashy. And if I'm looking for advertisements, you know, I, I can, I can go buy a course a business course or something like that. But if I see an advertisement for a business course where on the front sales page of the business course, there's a hot girl with big tits sitting on a Lamborghini with a bottle of champagne, you know, drizzling down her chest and a big stack of green hundred dollar bills in suitcases. If that's the front image, I'm immediately going to not do business with that course. You understand? Because that's not how you do serious business. No serious business person does business that way or thinks of business that way. This is business for idiots. Only idiots think that this is how business is done. Likewise, if I'm hiring a dating coach, let's say I have some problem dating. I need some advice, some pickup advice. I'm going to hire a coach. And I got two options. I got one coach who's just like a normal looking dude who just talk some sense and give some, some decent tips. And then I have another guy who says, I'm going to show you the flashy stuff. You know, he dresses up in a, in a $10,000 tuxedo and suit, and he's got five girls around him. He's doing a Dan Bilzerian fucking thing with a fast car and this. And then he starts promising you how many girls he's fucked. And he starts talking about how many threesomes he's had and all this kinds of stuff and how flashy it is. And he tells you how easy it's going to be and how you can, you can start fucking girls a week from now. Just sign up to my course right now. I'll give you a 50% discount. I'm not doing business with that coach. 
That's that's a coach who, who you know is full of shit. He's telling you bullshit. Because nothing serious and solid in life works that way. Stop looking for gimmicks. Stop looking for shortcuts. Stop looking for get which quick schemes. If I see an investment opportunity that promises me a 20% return on my investment, I immediately know it's full of shit. Why is that? Because the US economy, the best economy in the world, only grows after adjusting for inflation at a rate of about two to 3% a year. Now, some special companies, of course, can grow faster than that, but even a great company like Google or Apple is not growing at 50% a year or even 20% a year. You can't grow a company like Google 20% a year. It's unsustainable. Even if you can grow it for one year, it's gonna be a fluke year, you know? That's not sustainable growth. So when someone is prom promising you 50% return on investment or something like that, you know it's full of shit. You know there's a catch. You know it's a gimmick. It's not solid. So I would rather settle for a solid 10% return rather than chasing after 50% returns that will never pan out and will just lose me money. You see, I take that attitude towards everything, not just investing, but I basically look at everything I, I undertake, any project, development project, as investment. If I'm building a business, that's an investment I'm making. If I'm pursuing improving my dating skills, that's an investment I'm making. I'm putting a lot of time and energy into that. I don't want to waste my time and energy when I'm working on my dating skills. Uh, and so on. And, and even speaking of, you know, fast, flashy cars, these... These fucking Bugattis and things. This is These are the worst possible cars. You wouldn't even want to drive these fucking cars. They're so stupid. They're completely impractical, uneconomical, expensive to repair. They break easily. They have horrible warranties. Um, they have horrible resale value. They don't maintain their value. They're bad for the environment. And 10 other, other reasons. They're not even comfortable. Even sitting in that fucking uh, Bugatti is not comfortable. I would rather sit in a, in a Toyota comfortably than leaning back in a Bugatti barely fitting into that thing. Right? So, in your journey to becoming the best man that you can be, if you're right now in your teens or early 20s, what you got to understand is there's a lot of guys out there who are preying on young, dumb, reptilian, brain-minded individuals like yourself with flashy TikTok ads and Instagram videos and stuff like that to appeal to the, to the stupid in you. They're doing that with the, these NFTs, these crypto scams and investment options and opportunities and um, Ponzi schemes and with girls and all this kinds of stuff. And you know what? Girls are preying on you too. <laughs> girls are wise to this. A lot of these Instagram models, you know, they're sort of playing a con on you as well. Um, so step number one, if you want to become a truly powerful man, is that you need to build your whole life on a solid foundation. You're not doing that with what Andrew Tate is teaching you. He's teaching you the opposite of that. He's teaching you flimsy, get-rich-quick schemes and flimsy, unsustainable methods for how to get girls. So let's just think about this. Let's say you're you're an average guy who wants to get some hot girls. How would you do it? I mean, the funny thing is that the thing that Andrew Tate is teaching you isn't even going to work. It's not even going to get you laid. I mean, if at least it got you laid, you'd have something. Let's say that the girl was, com let's say you were completely unethical about how you got laid using Andrew Tate's method, but you still got laid doing it. Well, at least you'd get something. I mean, you'd be an asshole and a scumbag unethical, but at least you'd have something, but you're not even gonna get, gonna get that, you see. Where are you gonna find these girls to join your webcam company? Because how, how many webcam companies do you think um, can be run out there? And where are you gonna find these girls to, 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 to enter your, your sex trafficking scheme? You, you really think you're gonna, like, do you understand how, how manipulative you're gonna have to be to convince these girls to do what Andrew Tate convinced his girls to do? That's gonna be some like that that's some that's some cold-hearted shit you're gonna to have to do. 
unless you're a sociopath, most, most of you guys are not going to be able to do it. You're not going to have the heart for it. When these girls start crying, you're not going to have the heart for it. It's going to break your heart. See, Andrew Tate can do it because he's a cold-blooded sociopath. So he doesn't care. But most of you guys are not like that. So many of you are decent, kind-hearted guys. You, you, once you have sex with a girl, you're going to fall in love with her. You're going to like her. You're not going to want to pimp her out and take half her money and all this kinds of stuff. Um, also, like, so where are you going to find these, these girls to begin with? You think you're just going to like log on to Instagram and then just like DM some girl and tell her, hey, you want to join my webcam? <laughs> like, that's not, that's not going to work. Um, uh, and, and then if you're going to be recruiting your girlfriends into this business, well, you already have to have girlfriends. How many girlfriends do you already have? If you already have four girlfriends, you don't need Andrew Tate's help getting more of them. You already have four of them. In fact, Andrew Tate's system is going to lose you girls. You're going to have less sex because of Andrew Tate's system, not more sex. Andrew Tate lost three fourths of his girls, um, of his girlfriends, just doing what he does. Now, of course, can you build that up into a you know, full, well-oiled pimp operation if you really wanted to? Of course you could, but first realize that you're probably going to be breaking various kinds of state laws doing that. Uh, you're probably not going to feel very good about yourself doing that. Um, also, these girls are going to be leaving you. Now, see, if you're a sociopath and all you care about is using girls transactionally as sex objects, then you don't care because what you can do is you can just rotate through them. That's what a lot of pickup guys do. They don't care about these girls. They just, because they can just acquire a new one. So they just burn through girls. Uh, I want you to think about that. Think about, is that really the kind of foundation you want to build for how you deal with people in the future? Because remember, you're going to be doing business for the rest of your life, let's say, if you're going to be a solid, serious man, the way that supposedly we're trying to make you into, you know, being, right? That's the Andrew Tate project, make you into a serious man. Well, a serious man does business with people, serious business. So how successful are you going to be in your business deals if you're going to be using people transactionally the way that Andrew Tate does? How successful will you be if you're going to be breaking laws, not paying taxes, doing money laundering here, some wire fraud there? How successful is your business going to be long-term? Are people going to want to do business with you? Are people going to hold you as a high integrity character? Because, you know, people in the business world, serious business people are not stupid. Serious business people know because they've been burned by these kind of clowns like Andrew Tate who don't know how to do real business. They've been burned by these kinds of scammers, swind swindlers, con artists. You know, there's plenty of these guys on Wall Street and so forth. Plenty of these kinds of bullshitters who promise you investment returns that, and then they, they run away with your money and never deliver. Serious business people all understand how this works and they're all very cautious of this kind of bullshit. So the first thing that a serious business person is going to do when you sit down with them to discuss a deal is he's going to look at your history. He's going to want some business contacts and partners you've had in the past. He's going to want to get a sense of your character. Can he trust you? Are you a sociopath? A serious business person is good at identifying sociopaths, narcissists, posturers, and various kinds of people who are just, you know, puffing themselves up. Uh, con artists. Serious business people will identify these kinds of characters very quickly and not do business with them. So the only kinds of people you're going to be doing business with are low tier, other kinds of scammers and clowns like yourself. But then let's talk about your intimate relationships. How are you going to be treating your family? How are you going to be treating this girlfriend? You know, Andrew Tate says, like, well, he likes having girlfriends and he even wants to have a wife who will be the sort of trad wife, the traditional wife that stays at home and raises the children and does all this kinds of stuff. God forbid you ever have a child with a woman that you attract using Andrew Tate's method. This will be a complete disaster for your life. Do you understand this? Do you understand how insanely moronic this is? You are going to impregnate a woman who you pimp out on the internet to do sex work and who you have manipulated into falling in love with you through various kinds of tactics that you've been using, psychological trickery that you've been using, you think that this is going to lead to any kind of stable relationship? The relationship you're going to have with that woman is going to be so toxic. Not only are you going to 
drive yourself crazy, drive her crazy. She's going to drive you crazy. You two will both drive the kids crazy. The whole thing is going to all fall apart. You're going to left, be left with child payments for the rest of your life. She's going to take the kids. Is this what you want? Is you, do you want a string of these kinds of relationships? Now you say, well, Leo, I can just replace her. You're going to replace the mother of your children? Or you're going to replace, let's say you, you don't even have children with her. She's just a, a girlfriend. of you. You're going to replace these girlfriends? Girlfriends are not that easy to replace. Emotionally, I don't, I don't mean that you can't go to the club and find a new girl. I mean, emotionally, they're not that easy to replace. Nor should you want them to be. It would be toxic if it was easy for you to just throw away a girlfriend that you've been with for a few years, just throw her away on a whim. This is not how healthy, decent relationships work. So you're setting yourself up for utter disaster in your relationships, both with men and with women, if you adopt the Andrew Tate mindset. And if you're going to be surrounding yourself with other individuals who are like-minded like you, other fellow members of the Andrew Tate tribe, you are all going to create a sort of ecosystem together, a low ethics, low integrity, low consciousness ecosystem, echo chamber rather, I should say, echo chamber. And you're not even going to understand that there's anything wrong because together, when you have enough people come together, they can spin any kind of ideology, any kind of rationalization scheme to rationalize their behaviors. That's exactly the function that something like the pickup community or the red pill or the incel community or the black pill community or the MGTOW community or the Andrew Tate community, that's the function it serves. You see? It creates a sort of organizing philosophy that then is brainwashed into enough people that those people can come together and to delude themselves into thinking that they're good guys and that they're going to succeed with this philosophy and that this philosophy will scale within society. The reason that the Matrix is cracking down on this Andrew Tate philosophy is because it's fundamentally unsustainable. This misogyny is unsustainable. The reason we don't have widespread misogyny roaming free across America and the UK is because this would be a net negative for society if this was allowed. Now you individually, when you're very egocentric, you might say, well, but you know, but this kind of misogyny helps me to get the kind of women I want. Yeah. It helps you individually, maybe, but you have to understand that you're just one, one out of millions. There are larger considerations here which are way beyond your concern at this point because you're just so self-centered that you're not even thinking about these things. What do I mean by this? Here's an example. So, uh, I used to be very involved with RSD. Uh, during the RSD heyday, this was like back in 2014, 15, the RSD heyday here in Vegas, there was an, actually an RSD immersion program. There were so many RSD douchebags running around Vegas uh, like camping every club and so forth, that at one point, the Whole Foods, there's a Whole Foods in Vegas here um, that I go to, uh, that, that's very popular with, with the RSD crew. Um, there were so many RSD pickup guys camping the front entrance of the Whole Foods, that Whole Foods, they, they, they were literally approaching every single woman that would walk in and out of the Whole Foods because there's only one entrance point. The entrance and the en exit are the same door. They would just camp there for hours. Um, they harassed so many of these poor girls that eventually Whole Foods had to hire a security guard to stand guard at the entrance. And to this day, seven years later, there's still a security guard at that entrance. Now, I'm sure the security guard fulls, fulfills other functions as well. You know, it's, it's not just to keep the, the, the pickup guys <laughs> from camping the, the entrance, but um, that just shows you how unsustainable these kinds of, you know, uh, ideologies and um, subcultures can be. This is why mainstream society is anti-pickup. Because it actually isn't sustainable. It isn't scalable. Pickup works when it's done by a few people. It, it, it's not 
it doesn't work when you have 50% of the population doing it. See? Um, a very, very small handful of people can run some webcam girl business. Uh, the majority of you guys can't. Very few people can. It's a very unsustainable business model. It's a very bad business model. Even though it can potentially earn you some money really, really quickly. That's usually how it is. The, the business models that can earn you a lot of money really fast use, are usually very unsustainable and they collapse quickly, which is exactly now what happened with Andrew Tate. He lost his, uh, uh, he lost the majority of his business with his arrest. That's the problem with having unethical philosophies and business practices is that your business is then unsustainable. Your relationships are then unsustainable. Your friendships are unsustainable. Your family life is unsustainable. You won't have good relationship with your children. See, if you treat your, let's say you treat your customers like trash and you use them just, you, you, you only view them as a source of extracting wealth, the way Andrew Tate does with his webcam male customers. So let's say you do that and then you treat your employees, which is his girls, right? His webcam girls, you treat your employees also in that same transactional manner where you manipulate and threaten them to do work. And then you also treat your girlfriend that way. And then you also treat your wife that way. You see, you're also gonna treat your friends that way. And you're gonna treat your, you're gonna treat your children that way. Because the way you do one thing is the way you tend to do everything. Because how you do things is how your ego is structured. See, we're talking about the structure, the psychology of the ego and how it sees other people. Fundamentally, the error in all of Andrew Tate's philosophy is that he broke one of the cardinal principles of uh, building a happy, high quality life. You know what that is? One of the most important principles you'll ever hear in personal development is, is this. Surrender all desire to manipulate other people, to manipulate and control other people. If you try to build your life, your success, your business, and your relationships on controlling other people and manipulation of other people, you are guaranteed to create disasters and failures throughout the rest of your life, and you will never be happy. You cannot have happiness through controlling others. This is fundamentally impossible for deep psychological and even spiritual reasons. Because fundamentally, see, when you believe you can advance yourself in life by controlling and manipulating others, fundamentally what that means is that you think that other people are disposable and you fundamentally don't respect them. Fundamentally, Andrew Tate treats women disrespectfully. Now, he might disagree with that and say, oh, no, Leo, I just subscribe to the more traditional sort of, you know, old school way of, uh, you know, uh, male provider, woman, feminine, submissive, housewife, trad wife sort of model. That's okay. There is room for different kinds of relationships. And some relationships can be more progressive. Some can be more traditional. That's fine. But under no situation can you have a healthy relationship that's based on disrespect. If you want a more traditional relationship where you have a stay-at-home wife and she cooks for your kids and does all that, that's fine. You can do that if you find a wife who's into that kind of thing and there are women who are into that sort of thing. No problem. But you cannot do that through manipulation, through control, and you still have to respect her in the same way you would anyone else or in the same way you would want yourself to be respected. This is a fundamental spiritual principle. And the reason that is, is because fundamentally each one of us is a, a divine consciousness sovereign onto itself. Therefore, a fundamental spiritual principle is to respect the sovereignty of every conscious being. Andrew Tate completely violates this principle which is why what he's teaching cannot work. This is not speculation. These principles that I'm putting forth here, these are not just things I made up or read in a book. These are extremely profound principles that I spent a lot of time deriving for myself and 
you don't have to take my word on this. You can contemplate this stuff and you, you will see how true these principles are. It might take you five, 10 years to really see the power of this principle. If you want an immediate way to improve the quality of the rest of your life right now, make the following commitment to never again control or manipulate another human being ever in your life. Now that will make you a powerful man. Let's talk about what it means to be a powerful man because this has been bastardized by the likes of Andrew Tate and his ilk, the red pill community, even the pickup community and so forth. You have to differentiate between healthy masculinity versus toxic masculinity. You have to differentiate between being a man in a solid way and then juvenile, immature, surface level renditions of being a man. The surface level ideas of being a man, these are all childish stereotypes. This is what a young, dumb, horny teen looks up to as a role model. And this gets you into a lot of trouble. This is the flashy stuff. So this is, you know, your idea of being, being a, a true man in your mind if you're an Andrew Tate follower, it means something like having giant pecs and big biceps. The bigger, the more of a man you are, the taller you are, the, you know, the cockier your strut, and the nicer you dress, and the more assertive you are, and kind of dominant, and you've got these classic macho male stereotypes, and you've got the square jaw, and you've got that Brad Pitt look, and you've got that George Clooney swagger, that James Bond thing going on. This, it's all about image and vibe. This strikes at the heart of your reptilian brain. And there's some truth to it. If you've got all those attributes, surface level, yeah, girls will be attracted to that for sure, because it also tickles their reptilian brain too. In all of our reptilian brains, there's a little, you know, a little button you can tickle, which is just, it's tickled by the mere appearance of things. Like I can flash a picture of some tits up here. And if you're a normal straight guy, you're gonna um, you're gonna experience arousal because it just immediately tickles your reptilian brain. Do you see how easy it becomes to manipulate you? See, pickup artists and guys like Andrew Tate, uh, these kind of hustlers, as good as they are at manipulating women, they're even better at manipulating men. This is what a lot of the young guys who follow him don't understand. <laughs> the very same tactics that Andrew Tate is using to manipulate his webcam girls into taking off their panties for money and giving him half of it is exactly the same methods he's using on you young, young dumb guys to get you to pay him money too and to worship him. It's the exact same psychology. It, it's all about tickling the reptilian brain. He's puppet mastering you. That's all it is. You have to be wise enough to see past that. If you allow yourself to be just driven purely by your reptilian brain, you become easily puppet masterable. And people will puppet master you out of your life savings, your retirement, out of um, all the good stuff in life. They will make a fool out of you. You have to resist these temptations. So being a real man is not about the superficial aspects of looking macho or being macho. Um, what does it mean to be a real man? I actually have a two part series called how to be a man part one, part two. You can go check those out. That'll give you some some very kind of direct guidance. Here I want to go a little bit more big picture. It's because this is such a profound question. Yes, there is a component of being tough and strong in being a real man. But you have to distinguish between tough and strong as a sort of a posturing 
a sort of a braggadocious machismo versus tough and strong, like you're solid, you're grounded. And that solidity, that groundness is exactly what I'm talking about is that foundation. That foundation is based on principles, values, integrity, consciousness, knowing yourself very deeply, knowing what you stand for, not compromising with fools around you, not being manipulated by fools, not being pulled by emotions, not letting others manipulate your reptilian, your reptilian brain. And the additional layer to it is that, yes, you're tough and strong. First of all, how do you get that solid, tough and strongness? It's not through any kind of gimmickry. Because if you're doing it through gimmickry, that's going to be weakness. You're going to be insecure, fundamentally insecure, because you're going to be building something hollow. You do it through long-term patient investment in yourself, personal development, reading books, working on your business, working on your relationships, going out there and socializing, working on your dating skills, slowly building that stuff up with massive experience. That experience creates genuine confidence, creates genuine skills, and so forth. And then you don't need to be insecure because you've actually gone through the work necessary to earn those skills and it's backed by experience. Whereas if you're just puffing up your chest, you see, you don't have real skills. You don't have real experience. You can buy a fast car, but that doesn't mean that you have a solid, easygoing, flirtatious manner with girls. That takes years to build up. Learning how to be humorous with girls so that they're attracted to you, that takes years to develop. You can't go to some Andrew Tate online seminar and he's gonna teach you how to be funny with girls in half an hour. It doesn't work that way. Nothing in life that's solid works that way. Nothing valuable works that way. Those are just gimmicks and they're not going to work, which is why all the pickup lines and all this kind of stupid stuff, it doesn't work to attract girls. And if it does, it's going to, it's not going to be sustainable. It's also going to attract, you know, what kind of girls are you going to attract? That's the other thing we got to talk about here. There, there's so many threads here. I, I want to make sure I don't lose all of it. So we got to talk about what kind of girls you're going to attract. Let's remember that one. Let's finish up this idea of, of, of the, the true masculinity. So true masculinity requires you go through all the difficult experience and you gotta work. See, a, a real man works to be a man. You don't become a man by going to a weekend seminar or some online course a couple of times a year. Uh, no workshop is gonna make you a man. You do it through a, a multi-decades long, lifelong process of working on yourself as a man. Uh, following certain psychological and spiritual principles. One of which, for example, is to not manipulate others, not control other people. That's one principle of being a, a good man. Uh, there are many other principles we could talk about. I, I've outlined some of those in my How to Be a Man Part 1, Part 2 series. Um, check out that out. Um, but I'll, I'll also mention this. Being tough and strong through hard work and following principles and then using your strength in the defense of others who are weaker than you. To me, this would be the epitome of what it means to be a good man. Because if you become tough and strong, and then you use that toughness and strength to bully those who are weaker than you and to exploit them and to defraud them and to hustle them, that's you being a bad man. And that's exactly what Andrew Tate has been teaching you how to do. Andrew Tate has been teaching you how to become stronger so that you can, well, actually he's been teaching you how to become stronger. Here's technically what he's been teaching you. Andrew Tate has been teaching young men how to become stronger at the expense of other women and other men. And that's fundamentally the problem that I have with his philosophy and fundamentally why he's been canceled. Why people don't like him in the mainstream. Because that's not a good thing. 
the world does need strong men. That's true. But the world needs strong, ethical men who will use their strength and be role models and inspire others and protect the weak against bad men, other strong men who are unscrupulous, devilish, and willing to exploit and abuse anyone in a sociopathic transactional manner. That's the function of a good man. And that's the kind of man that every woman wants to fall in love with. Now, is it possible for you to manipulate women into falling in love with you as a bad man? Absolutely. Absolutely. Women are very easily manipulatable creatures. And it's very easy to um, seduce a girl into falling in love with, with your strength, but then you're going to use that strength to hurt her, your children, her friends, your friends, and everybody around you, and to destroy society. And in general, ladies, you have a problem in that you do not have a you're not disciplined, and nobody really taught you how to distinguish good from bad men. That's something I'll have a whole episode on in the future <laughs> for you ladies. How to distinguish uh, good, good from bad men. Um, well, here's one way, is that the good man, in essence, is not going to use his strength to exploit and abuse and manipulate and control those who he is leading. There's two types of leaders. There's the, there's the kind of leader who leads men, but then fundamentally doesn't respect the ones he's leading, and then he's actually just using them as suckers to get power, money, influence from them, and ultimately he's just using them to exploit them. There's that kind of leader. And then that would be the selfish leader. And then there's the selfless leader, which is the kind of leader who is strong and capable and integrous, has integrity, and would never dare to exploit his followers and his supporters. He wouldn't take a penny from them, even if he could. Um, for example, I've had, I've had people, I've had people message me, private message me on my forum, offering me, offering to pay me a thousand dollars donation. Just donate a thousand dollars. And they asked me, Leo, tell me, uh, tell me your PayPal account or tell me your Bitcoin address so I can just send you a thousand dollars. I just want to say thank you. Um, I think I've even had people offer me five thousand dollars. Just give me your address and I'll, I'll wire it to you, they said. What do I respond to them with? I say, thank you, that's not necessary. Implement my work, that's payment enough for me. That's the kind of leader you want to be. That's the kind of man you want to be. You don't want to be jumping at the bit to look for every way you can suck money out of your followers. A true leader wouldn't do that because he's not in it for that. He's not in it for the money. I'm not in it for the money. I don't care about the money. How weak of a man do you have to be that somebody offers you some money and you jump on it? You're so desperate for it. Likewise, how weak do you have to be as a man when some girl offers you some pussy and you jump on it like a, like a desperate dog on a bone? See, a true man, a woman throws himself on you and you say, not right now. It's not appropriate. You need that power as a man. That's true strength. Do you see that? Strength is very counterintuitive. You think that strength is your ability to dominate others. It's not. You think that strength is your ability to coerce others and manipulate them into giving you sex and money and everything you want. That's not true strength. Strength takes us into spirituality. Spiritual strength is your ability to accept, to surrender to let go, to set your ego aside, 
to set your personal desires and needs aside, to sacrifice, to endure difficulty and pain and suffering for a higher cause, to be patient. See, the fundamental weakness that a lot of these Andrew Tate characters prey upon, these, the Ty Lopez characters and so forth they prey upon, is that when you're young and you're immature, you're impatient. You want money now. You want pussy now. You don't want to work for it. You don't want to go through all the hard experience it takes to acquire it. Legitimately, therefore, you look for shortcuts because you're impatient. And that's where you get yourself into trouble. So, yes, it is true that we're having a sort of a masculinity crisis right now. Personally, what I attribute that to is not to women and to feminism and to stage green and hippies and LGBTQ and trans people and uh, the Me Too movement and social justice warriors. That's not the, the real reason. A lot of what we're, um, the reason we're having a masculinity crisis is simply because it's not really taught anymore in schools. And we're also so alienated now, we're all online. Everyone's playing video games, especially boys. Boys and teens are all addicted to video games. You're online all the time, on these forums, on Reddit, on YouTube, on these Discord servers. This is extremely unhealthy. It has basically produced a generation or two of young men who do not know how to socialize, have no experience with the opposite sex, and have no opportunities to really test their mettle as a leader or as a man. You know, in the past, when we were more physical, we were more outdoors, there were more sports activities, stuff like that. There were more sort of these activities that could, that could test your mettle and give you opportunities to like prove yourself as a man. But today, what? You're playing fucking Mario Kart from age six to, to age, uh, you know, 20? Well, and what is this? This is not going to make you a man. Of course, this makes you soft, this makes you lazy, this makes you undisciplined, you don't learn anything about leadership and so on. So it is true that we need to teach men how to be better leaders and how to have more experience with women and so forth, but there's a right and a wrong way to go about that. There's a toxic and there's a healthy version of that. When it comes to traditional sort of family values and relationships. There's also a right and a wrong way to do that. There's, there's healthy and there's toxic versions of that. If you want to find a beautiful girl, get married with her, make her your housewife, and she's down for that, and, and you want to have children, and she's going to be working on, you know, educating your children and feeding them and so forth, and you're going to be bringing home the paycheck. If you want to split things up in this way, sort of the way that our parents used to do, grandparents used to do, the sort of classical traditional method, uh, you can certainly do that. Um, but remember that just because you're doing it that way doesn't mean it's going to be healthy. There's a toxic way of doing that. If you do that because you need this girl to feed your narcissism, because you're so egotistical, you can't share with her, you know, making decisions. You need to suppress her. You need to feel um, above her you fundamentally disrespect her. See, there are, there are fundamental dynamics that are, that are toxic and broken that are going to lead to a very bad family situation. On the other hand, if you do this in a way where you genuinely respect her and you're not doing it out of fear and insecurity and you're not trying to dominate her and you're comfortable sharing decision-making and this kinds of stuff, um, then it can work in a beautiful way. See? But it's very clear just watching what Andrew Tate is doing that he's not doing it from a place of respect. He clearly has zero respect for women, despite whatever he might say. He might say he loves them or he might say he likes a traditional, he's just a very traditional guy and, you know, he just likes the, he likes it the old school way. No, 
these are these are excuses. I mean, I'm sure he does like the old school way, but that that does not overcome the the, the core problem. There is that he does he doesn't respect women, and the reason he doesn't respect women, I would assume, is that if you dig into his childhood, he was abused in some fashion or another by his father, by his mother. He had some sort of toxic relationships there, or he has some sort of toxic relationship with an early girlfriend, which led to this uh, situation where now he fundamentally can't relate to women on a human level. He relates to them like animals, or even worse, like uh, like um, like sex toys. That's really how he relates to them. And you could see it in his tone, his condescension, his arrogance, his egotism, the way he speaks. It's, just, it's very easy to read. He is his own worst enemy. Everything that he is, is is very easy to read right off of his face as he's speaking. You don't need to read very far into it. You don't need to go digging around into his archives too deeply. Just watch a couple of minutes of one of his uh, videos. And I'm not talking to one where you take something out of context. I mean, take him in full context. Full context. Uh, the things he's saying are, 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 are toxic nonsense. Andrew Tate is the poster boy for toxic masculinity. But remember, just because I say that does not mean that now you have to give up on being masculine. Not at all. It's very important that you pursue healthy masculinity. And no, no healthy woman is going to deny you that. Healthy feminine women want men to pursue healthy masculinity. What they're opposed to what the Me Too movement and so forth and social justice warriors are opposed to is they're opposed to toxic masculinity. That's it. It's not complicated. They don't have some sort of ulterior agenda to keep men down. <laughs> Why? Why would they want to keep men down? They don't want to keep men down. They just want to keep the toxicity down. Because men, left to their own devices, can become very toxic. This is nothing new. It's been this way throughout all of history. Men can be very toxic. That doesn't mean men are bad. It just means the toxic is bad. So we have to differentiate between what's toxic and what's healthy. So you might be wondering, well, Leo, what do I do now? Even if I agree with you, let's say, um, the reason you might not want to agree with me is because Fundamentally, what, what you want is you're looking for a solution to a couple of problems that you have as a young man. Which is, Leo, how do I get the quality of girl that I want and sex? How do I get the money that I want? How do I get some of these cool goodies, like the, some of the status that you might want? You know, the cool clothes, the cool car, the cool vacation and the cool photos and on Instagram and stuff. How do I get that stuff? You know, that, some of that flashy, cool stuff. I deserve to have that. How do I get it? Well, I can feed you bullshit to your reptilian brain, the stuff that you want to hear. I can tell you what you want to hear, or I can tell you how it really works. See, part of being a man and growing up is accepting difficult truths. In fact, that's another important point here. One of the ways you distinguish um, true masculinity from all the toxic garbage is truth. Truth is a fundamental core value to all personal and spiritual development. If you don't have truth, if you compromise on truth, you will have nothing. I promise you. You do not appreciate yet how powerful and important truth is of a principle. Just truth. Truth. Be truthful. Truth means that you look at situations honestly, truthfully. You're willing to accept difficult truths. You don't bullshit yourself. You don't lie to yourself. You don't project. You don't deny. You don't come up with ideologies and excuses and stories. Truth. You also don't feed into your own biases. You're aware of your biases. Go check out my episode called Self-Bias and also my episode called Understanding Bias. Very important. Truth means a keen awareness of your own biases and being able to transcend them. Fundamentally, what Andrew Tate is doing is untruthful. Exploiting 
lying to people, swindling people, hustling people, giving people fake tax forms, not paying your taxes, stealing people's passports and not giving it back to them, making exaggerated or false promises about what your business program will teach your customers, teaching your employees to lie and to extract money through fraud and stories and deceptions from your clients. This is all fundamentally against the principle of truth. It's untruthful. Truth and integrity go hand in hand. I have an episode called, What is Integrity? Go check that out. Very important one. A man who isn't truthful is out of integrity and is going to be a toxic man. Now, see, Andrew Tate can, can try to rebut this by saying, well, but Leo, I, I really believe in these principles. You're making it sound like I'm a fake or a fraud because I, I talk about traditional values and I talk about, you know, dominating women and I talk about some of these other things, but I'm being honest. This is what I actually honestly believe. Yeah, you're being honest in that you're showing us your true character. But the true character you're showing us is one of dishonesty. Manipulating people in the way that you do is not honest, even if you believe in it. Even if your philosophy is that I am the strong and the strong deserve to dominate and manipulate the weak. Even if that's your philosophy, that's fundamentally false. That's dishonest. Even if you believe that men are superior to women, you might say, well, that, that's just my belief. That's truthful. No, that's your bias. That's your selfishness talking. You're not aware enough to see yet how your own biases are being used by your mind to spin a philosophy that you yourself think that you're in alignment with. And in a sense, you are in alignment with it. In a certain sense, Tate is very authentic in a certain sense because he just comes out there and says that he does tax evasion. Okay. You can come out and say that. You can come out and say, I believe I shouldn't have to pay taxes, but that doesn't make it aligned with truth. Do not underestimate the power of truth. Truth is one of those very subtle things because see, your reptilian mind is going to want to say, well, but truth, you know, Leo, who cares about truth? I just want to fuck and I want a car and I want some status and I want to go to the nightclub and, you know, party and have some champagne and stuff like that. That's what I want. I don't, I don't, truth. What was truth going to get me in life? You know, truth is not going to get me ahead in life. In fact, it's like, isn't truth going to handicap me? Because it's almost like, Leo, you're telling me to fight with one arm tied behind my back because the other people out there in the business world, they're not truthful. Leo, you know, people in government are full of shit. People in the news are full of shit. And other businessmen are full of shit. And girls are full of shit. And so why should I be truthful? Well, you see, this is a real test of your manhood and your character right here. There are a lot of dumb foolish, ethically dubious and shaky characters all around the world. There's millions of them. What it means to be a powerful, good man is that you don't get distracted by that stuff. See, what it means to honor a principle like truth or non-manipulation or consciousness or ethics or love, any of these kinds of principles is that you follow these principles precisely when everybody around you is doing the opposite. See, when I go to a Vegas nightclub, everybody around me is drinking. Everybody is drunk. I'm there sober. Because that's a principle I have. I don't compromise on that principle. 
when I'm out there talking to girls, these girls, for example, at the end of the nightclub, they're buying these giant greasy pizzas and they're stuffing their face with this pizza. So are all my friends. I don't touch the pizza. I don't want that poison in my body. That's a principle I have. This is how you distinguish yourself from everybody else. This is how you create value in the world is by being different. You create value in the world by doing the things that almost nobody else is willing to do because they don't have enough principle and discipline to do it. Most people are not disciplined enough to say no in the wrong situation. Most people, if they just see somebody left their wallet on the table, you know, most people are not disciplined enough to say no and not take the money. Most people are going to go there and try to steal some money from it, from the wallet. And um, in business, you know, most business people are not disciplined enough to say, no, we're not going to fleece our customers. We're not going to price gouge our customers. Therefore, they start exploiting their customers. Then what happens? See my episode called How Brands, How Modern Brands Exploit You, where I discuss this. Many modern brands, I'm sure you've experienced this as a consumer, is that it starts off as a good brand at first, right? You're happy with it. Maybe it's a, an Apple phone or a, mm, what else? What other, you know, other kinds of electronics and stuff out there. Um, some video game franchise, you know, Call of Duty, whatever. It's a good brand at first. But then over the years, what happens is that you get the original people who were building those brands, you know, they had high integrity. Founders of these companies had high integrity. When George Lucas created Star Wars, he had high integrity. That's what made Star Wars so good and so valuable. Made into a multi-billion dollar franchise. Then he sold it to Disney. Disney has much looser ethics and integrity than George Lucas had. And therefore, they start pumping out low quality, just filler Star Wars content, which is garbage. Um, and yet they charge you the same price, if not more for it. See, and then this deteriorates the, the quality of the brand, goes to the toilet. Right now, the Star Wars brand is pretty much in the toilet, as it should be, given what Disney has done with it. See, um, because it's difficult to maintain that integrity over a period of years and years and years and years. That takes a special rare kind of man or woman to do that. So... A lot of what it means to build yourself up as a man and to build wealth in your life. See, wealth is not just a measure of how much money you have. Wealth is also about the assets you build up. And I don't, I don't just mean your house and your yacht and so forth. More importantly, it's the internal assets, your mindset, your education, the skills that you have, your communication abilities, you know, what you're able to get done in the world, what you understand about life, about women. These are all assets. This is all your wealth. If you treat women like shit, that doesn't, that means you're not wealthy because you're not going to have a, an abundance of high quality relationships in your life. You're going to have a, a, just a, a string of fucking trash. So you're going to have this sort of fake wealth. It's fool's gold. Really? That's what you're being sold by Andrew Tate, Ty Lopez, and these other idiots. It's fool's gold. You're being sold fool's gold because you're a fucking fool and they treat you like a fool and behind your back, they laugh at you for the fool that you are because they know that only a fool would fall for this shit. If you want to understand a technical definition of what a fool is, go check out my episode called What is Wisdom? Where I define wisdom and its opposite, which is foolishness. And really what we're talking about this whole episode is just foolishness, pure fucking foolishness. That's what Andrew Tate teaches. This is not an insult of his work. It's just a, a statement of fact about the immaturity, the psychological immaturity of what he's teaching. Now look, to be fair to him, there are a lot of psychologically immature people in the world. And honestly, the stuff that I teach is extremely mature and advanced and inappropriate for many immature people. Many people listening to this, they're at Andrew Tate's level of maturity. So when you hear this message here, there's a, there's a disconnect. I'm not sure how many of you are going to be able to make that leap from the immature to see that what you've been taught is immaturity and that you need to transcend beyond that to something real that's not fool's gold. Many of you will still want to 
entertain fantasies of the fool's goal because you've been sold on this fantasy and you don't want to give it up so easily. But this is part of what it means to be a real man, is to face the truth. When you've been fooled by some crypto scheme, some Ty Lopez swindler or whoever else, it, it hurts, it stings. I've been fooled by some of these schemes and scams in the past. I, I know it stings. It can sting. You could lose your life savings. You could set yourself back a few years. You could get involved in some criminal activity that you're going to regret later. You can debase yourself. You can start to subscribe to these kind of toxic, you know, red pill ideologies and so forth. This is corrupting your mind. Literally, your mind is being poisoned with these online ideologies. And then it's difficult to admit to yourself that I've been fooled by this and I've set myself back because, again, it's... It's like insult on top of injury. Not only did they take my money and my time, but uh, now I have to do extra work to unwire all this shit that they fed into my mind. But if you really want to make progress, you can't have progress without truth. Everything begins with truth. You have to admit to yourself where you've made mistakes, where you've been foolish, Forgive yourself for that. I'm not sitting here judging you for falling into one of these foolish traps. It's just, it just is what it is. It's, it's your lack of experience. It's, you know, it's your reptilian brain. We all get cravings and tempt, we get temptations sometimes. We get seduced by some juicy looking advertisement or some promise of an investment scheme that's too good to be true. We all get seduced by that kind of stuff. We're, we're human. But, uh, but look, you have an option. You can either resist me on this and be in denial and start to invent stories and start to accuse me of whatever. Or you can own up to this. You can sit down, reflect on this kind of stuff and realize that, yeah, I've been sold some fool's gold. And my whole philosophy and approach to how to develop myself and to create the kind of wealth and success and abundance that I want in my life and the kind of sex that I want to have, that all of that, you can create that stuff. That's not a fantasy. I've done it. I've created a passive income business. I've created over a million dollars in online sales. I've done that stuff. Um, uh, I've attracted very beautiful girls. I've attracted inst Instagram models. I've attracted girls that if I showed you photo photos of them, you think they're Playboy models. You wouldn't believe it. Uh, a guy who looks like me should not have been able to sleep with a girl like that. I've done these kinds of things, and these are not easy things to do. I appreciate how difficult it is. All of these things took years. They took a lot of careful wisdom. They took a lot of planning and strategy, and I had to really think through these things, and I had to... I had to genuinely build it through experience, not through any kind of gimmickry. I had to provide genuine value to people. A lot more than I got back in return. But also, it was extremely rewarding. So part of what it means to be a high-quality man is that you're willing to do the work. Rather than looking for some sort of shortcut. You're willing to take on the emotional labor that comes with making money, with attracting quality women with getting better at your humor, your social skills, your communication skills, um, and so on and so forth. And to commit to doing that at nobody else's expense. See, yeah, it is harder to do conscious business rather than unethical business. I have this principle that I call conscious business, which means it's not just about how much money you can earn. It's easy to make a business that just earns money, come what may, at any cost. The question is, what are the externalities? What are the costs? The more conscious you become, the more responsible you become, the more cognizant you become of your impact on others in the world, the more empathy you develop. Fundamentally, what Andrew Tate and his cronies lack is empathy. There's no empathy there at all. There's no consciousness of one's impact on the broader society. 
In fact, there's a sort of a disdain for it. It's almost like, yeah, um, I'm getting ahead in the world. I'm breaking things along the way. I'm hurting people. And then this is actually a, a point of pride because I'm breaking the matrix. I'm sticking it to the man. I'm anti-mainstream. Dude, you're not anti-mainstream when you sex traffic people or when you rape girls. That's not anti-mainstream. That's not something to be proud of. To be some kind of rebel there. Like, yeah, you're fighting the status quo by raping girls. No. This is also fool's gold. This kind of anti-mainstream ism that is very popular these days in these online ecosystems. This is all fool's gold. Sometimes the status quo in the mainstream is corrupt and tyrannical. But that does not mean that some stupid scheme that Andrew Tate has come up with or whatever is the antidote to that. This Andrew Tate stuff is, is even worse than that. If Andrew Tate was allowed to, he would be a tyrant. He's the definition of tyranny. He would be the one who would create the matrix to impose it on you if only given the opportunity. People like him in the ancient times were warlords and kings and despots. And they didn't treat their people well. They abused them, exploited them, raped them, enslaved them in every possible way. And eventually they were all killed and deposed. Why is that? Because nobody likes to live under such a system. It's a fundamentally anti-democratic, unfair, unloving, unconscious system that ends up being worse for everybody. It's not just bad for the little guys. It's not just bad for the weak. It's also bad for the strong. You might say, well, Leo, you know, my philosophy is that in the world, there's the, there's the weak and there's the strong. And uh, I was born to the class of the alpha, the strong, and then many were born into the, the beta, the, the weak. And it's the beta and the weak and the women and all of them that, that, that get dominated by the strong. And this is just the order of things. This is just how nature is. This is the natural flow. This is the traditional method. And this is how it was in the good old times. And we got to get back to this kind of society. You don't understand what you're talking about. You don't understand the brutality of this kind of system. Right now, you have fooled yourself into thinking that you're the strong. In reality... The problem with this idea of, you know, dog eat dog, strong dominates the weak, is that there's always someone who's stronger than you. There's always someone who has a bigger gun, a bigger bomb than you. So while you go out there and you bully these poor, weak, naive girls, let's say, you bully them into your sex trafficking ring, somebody else will come along, some mafioso, some Tony Soprano type of character will come along he will um, um, find your little operation and, um, you know, he will get a bunch of goons and they'll come and they'll shake you down and take all your money and they'll extort you. And very quickly, you'll find out that um, you thought you were the strong, but actually you were in the middle and there was someone stronger than you who now has made you his bitch. And no amount of going to Andrew Tate seminars is going to save you from this. No amount of winning boxing competitions, no amount of testosterone, no amount of Bugattis is going to save you from this. Because in the end, there's going to be a hundred people with, uh, with fucking machine guns who will kill you. And, um, and you might say, well, oh yeah, Leo, I'm going to fight them. I'm going to have my own posse of 150 people with machine guns and ours are going to be bigger and we're going to have grenades and we're going to kill them. Well, see, now what you created is you created war. And war, you might think that, oh, you're so tough and macho that you want to go to war. You might say, Leo, I want to go to war. I'll dominate everybody and I'll prove myself to be the best man. The reality of war is that war is lose-lose. Everybody loses in war. You think you're going to dominate and then you end up getting dominated. Look at Hitler. Look at Napoleon. Look at what's happening in Ukraine right now with Putin. You know, Putin thought he could just roll his tanks into Ukraine and just roll into the place and just dominate it, take it for himself. And now he's finding out it's not so easy. See, even when you have a, an army the size of Russia with a nuclear arsenal, it's not so easy to, 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 to take over a little country like Ukraine. 
he's feeling that pain. That's the reality of war. That's the reality of living in this sort of dog-eat-dog, uncivilized way. Fundamentally, what you're advocating for, what Andrew Tate is advocating for, is a, is a barbaric society. Now, if you're an insecure man, and you, you, you have a sort of a longing, that sort of fascistic longing for a strong man authoritarian leader, those good old days where we had structure and monarchy and this kind of stuff, um, you might, you might, if you're an authoritarian, you might want to live in a society that's authoritarian. Because you've actually fooled yourself into thinking that you would benefit under that system. The reality is that under an authoritarian system is very much like, uh, you know, that classic trope in the movies of uh, raising the, 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 the wizard who raises a necromancer. Or I mean, um, no, sorry, I got that wrong. The necromancer who raises a demon. You know, you know this classic trope in video games and in movies where you got a necromancer and he's got some plan to raise this evil demon and he's going to, his plan is he's going to control this evil demon to dominate the whole world. But then what happens? Once the evil demon is out, of course, the demon is evil. So the first person the demon kills is the necromancer. And then the demon goes to town on everybody else as well. And then we got to save the world from this, from this demon. And it was the stupidity of this necromancer thinking that, you know, he was arrogant enough to think he could control this demon. Well, this is sort of what... Tate is unleashing onto the world here. Um, you're playing with forces you don't understand that are going to end up backfiring and boomeranging on you. That's how ego works. This is inevitable for ego. This is what selfishness is. This is why selfishness is problematic. The more selfish your attitude towards life, the more you're going to surround yourself with other selfish people, which, are, which is going to create a sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy effect, a cycle, a vicious cycle of, of egotism and selfishness and theft and lying and cheating and killing and raping and trafficking and exploiting and defrauding. That's not a kind of society we want to live in. You know what we call those societies? We call those third world countries. You can find countries like that in the world. Lawless countries like Somalia, Liberia, many places in Africa, places in the Middle East, Afghanistan and elsewhere. These are very harsh environments. And they have looser laws. Yeah, they have looser rape laws. If you want to get away with rape, go to Somalia, go to Liberia, go to uh, Afghanistan. You'll be able to do it. But that's not something to be proud of. You're literally stepping back in time to a society which is less fair, less pleasant. And notice that these societies, they're not wealthy societies. That's because if you want wealth and economic prosperity, the way you get that is by having a society where people are working peacefully together so that there can be trade and business and all that stuff. Because you know what's, you know what's bad for business and for wealth? It's rape. It's theft, it's the mafia, it's lack of laws, it's a corrupt court system. This is very bad for business. This is why it's very difficult to do business in places like Somalia, Liberia, or Russia. It's all based on bribes. And once, what ends up happening in these kinds of systems is that people are disrespected, People's sovereignty is disrespected. Uh, and the ones who end up on top are just the most vicious and ruthless. Not the, the most deserving, not the most talented, not the most intelligent, just the most ruthless. Now, again, you might, if you fancy that you're going to be that guy at the top, you can kind of trick yourself into thinking that, yeah, that might be a good system. Trust me, you're not going to be that guy at the top. You're kidding yourself. It's not a good system. And even for that guy at the top, it's not a good system because that guy at the top, he's never secure. It's, an inse it's a fundamentally insecure structure because that guy at the top has to be worried about being backstabbed, betrayed, assassinated every day of his life. And chances are he will be sooner or later. 
in these kinds of countries, under these kinds of uh, governments, assassinations are very common. Coups are very common. There's no law and order. To have law and order and prosperity requires truth, integrity of the court system, uncorrupted police, lawyers, a bureaucracy, tax collection, and many, many other kinds of infrastructure like this. The reason that the UK and the US are two of the most economically prosperous countries in the world is precisely because they have strict rape laws. I want you to think about that. See, if you're just a young guy who's looking to get laid, it's kind of cool, you know, between you and your friends, you're kind of like, oh yeah, ha, 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 oh, that'd be cool. Let's go, let's go travel to a country where there's like loose rape laws so we can just like get girls drunk and then fuck them. That'd be kind of cool, huh? Like, yeah, that's, that's kind of like fun for like a sort of a, like a frat boy party, uh, you know, philosophy discussion. But in the real world, it's exactly the opposite of that. Think about if you had a daughter, where you'd want to raise her. Do you want to raise her in Romania? Where the rape laws are supposedly so lax? Although I don't even know how lax they are. I mean, apparently, <laughs> you know, um, I, I guess the biggest indictment of, of Andrew Tate is this, is that by his own admission, he moved to Romania because he said the, the rape laws were lax there. But apparently he's such a rapist that he couldn't even contain himself to within the bounds of those loose rape laws. <laughs> um, so how big of a rapist do you have to be to be arrested for rape in Romania? To be arrested for sex trafficking in Romania? You know, people say, well, but Leo, in Romania, the police is very corrupt. And so uh, how can we trust them? Uh, they probably just arrested him for some corrupt bullshit reasons, and it's not true. But see, it goes both ways. If the police in Romania are so corrupt as you say, and Andrew Tate is this rich multimillionaire as he claims to be, then why would he get ever get arrested in Romania? He should have been wise and uh, wealthy enough to pay off all the bribes and never get arrested, right? That's your logic. It's not my logic. It's your logic. Because it's so corrupt over there, right? You can't have it both ways. You can't say that, oh, well, uh, it's not fair that Tate got um, arrested in Romania because it's so corrupt over there. But the reason he flew to Romania in the first place is precisely because it's so corrupt over there that the rape laws bar barely exist. You can't have it both ways. So which is it? Andrew Tate didn't wind up in Romania by accident. He deliberately chose Romania because the, he knew that there was, in that area, a lot of beautiful Eastern European women who um, who whose economic situation is such that they're easily exploitable by opening up to the whole global market through um, online and webcams. It was because of a combination of that and the fact that he knew that the laws there were such and the, um, you know, the foreign currency exchange rates were such that it would be highly beneficial for him to do his shady business there. The kind of shady business he was doing would be way too dangerous to do in a first world developed country. That's why he moved to Romania. But even that didn't save him. That's not the fault of Romanian government corruption. That's the severity of Tate's unethicalness and depravity. His arrogance and narcissism to think that he could do this just like out in the open. <laughs> you know? He probably could have gotten away with all of it if he just kept his mouth shut. But he was too arrogant to keep his mouth shut because he wanted to brag and he wanted to use that to make even more money because the bragging he did on social media just got him more followers who, to whom he could sell more of his, uh, you know, bullshit courses. Once you start seriously investing energy and time 
into figuring out how to lay a solid foundation for your life and to invest in yourself and build it carefully over time, you are gonna be very careful about surrounding yourself with such characters as Andrew Tate because they become very dangerous to you. Because these are the kind of guys that will prey on you. Everything you've built up carefully over a decade, all the work you've done to, to build your girlfriend and your family and your children and set up your business properly and doing everything ethically, pay all your taxes, all this, you did all this. And in an instant, a guy like Andrew Tate can come into your life, a sociopath, scammer, could come up with some kind of scheme. You know, he's gonna sit down in a room and he's gonna ask himself a question. Okay, my friend, I know my friend is pretty wealthy. I need money. I'm gonna sit in this room all day long until I can figure out a way how to, how to scam my friend out of all of his money. That's literally what Andrew Tate would do if he was in, you know, in a bind and he needed money. And he had you around, um, you know, who had something to give him. And then, and then he, he would come up with that way. And then if you were gullible and you, you were a bad judge of character and you thought you could befriend this guy and that he was gonna, you know, uh, be your buddy, and that all of his exploits, you know, that's just stuff he does to other people, not to you. Well, you're going to be in for a very rude awakening and you're going to lose everything. Now, let's get back to that tangent that we left off uh, a while back, which is remember that your level of development and consciousness and integrity, your value system is going to attract like-minded people to you. So if your philosophy is the Andrew Tate philosophy of using people transactionally, all the good people in the world, all the most intelligent, spiritual, moral, ethical, loving people who you would want to have deep friendships and relationships and marriages with and so forth, these people, the most amazing people in the world, these people are gonna have too much respect for themselves to stick around with you because they're gonna be immediately turned off by your toxic value system by your lying, your cheating, your manipulating. They don't like being manipulated. A high consciousness individual, you know one of the characteristics of a highly conscious, spiritually developed individual? They're impossible to manipulate. At this point in my life, I'm so spiritually mature, nobody on the planet can psychologically manipulate me because nobody understands psychology better than me. <laughs> and the reason that is is not because, you know, I'm bragging or anything. It's because I just spent so much time studying my own self-deceptions. I know all the ways that I manipulate myself psychologically better than anybody else does. There's no con artist who, who can manipulate me better than I manipulate, know how to manipulate myself. This is extremely powerful. This is one thing that makes for a strong, integrous man. And this is what you need because the more spiritual you become, genuinely spiritual, not just, I'm not talking about some religion here or some ideology of believing in God. I'm talking about genuine spiritual development. The more spiritually developed you become, the more conscious you become, the more everybody around you is gonna fuck with you and test your level of consciousness. This is just fundamentally what happens. And therefore, to maintain your level of consciousness, you're gonna, you're gonna have to take integrity even more serious. So. The more you grow as a man or as a human, this applies to women as well, the more you grow, the more important integrity becomes. When you first start off in life, integrity seems like some sort of like old timey, hokey pokey, kind of like squarish concept. It's like, who really needs it? And you look around you and you see all these people acting in reckless, unethical ways. And you're like, well, do I really need to be integrous and ethical? Eh, maybe not and you can get away with it sometimes, but as you grow spiritually, that becomes impossible. Because to keep being unethical, you have to keep lying. You have to keep lying to your customers, to your friends, to your partners, to your spouses, to your children, and most importantly, to yourself. Spirituality is the pursuit of absolute truth. The closer you get to absolute truth, the less fudge and wiggle room there is for self-deception and lying to yourself. All of your lies have to go. This is extremely painful. This takes real work. This is what spiritual development is about at its core, is facing all of your lies. See, the situation with Andrew Tate is that he honestly believes his own philosophy. He doesn't think he's a rapist. 
He doesn't think he's a sex trafficker. He doesn't think he's a swindler or a thief. He thinks he's an upstanding, righteous guy. Of course he does. This doesn't make him so. He's lying to himself. That's how the ego works. That's how narcissism works. Narcissism is a, is a lifelong lie that you're living. Donald Trump is living a never-ending stream of lies his whole life. That's what his whole life is. It's just lie upon lie upon lie upon lie. This works at low levels of development. You can get rich doing that. But you cannot become spiritually actualized doing that. And you cannot have healthy human relations doing that because all of your lies, you know, and remember how you do one thing is how you're going to do everything. If you cheat girls, you're going to cheat guys too. What's the difference in your mind? There's not going to be a difference. You're not going to have some sort of integrous principled position where it's like, well, you know what, Leo, I fuck the girls and cheat the girls, but I treat guys properly and respectfully and respect guys. No, when you disrespect girls, you're going to disrespect respect guys too. You see? When you don't pay your taxes, you're going to be cheating in business in a hundred other ways. You're going to be stealing from your customers. You're going to be stealing from your employees. You're going to be coercing them. You might say, well, Leo, but why should I care about this kind of spiritual development? After all, spiritual development, you know, doesn't compare to hot women and cars and nightclubs and Bugattis and stuff. See, you're still too young and mature and inexperienced to yet understand that this stuff, the fantasy life that Dan Bilzerian and Andrew Tate are selling you that this, this is nonsense. This is not going to make you happy. It's fool's gold, literally fool's gold. That's what that is. I've had many of those things. It doesn't make you happy. Celebrities have all those things. It doesn't make them happy. Rich CEOs have all those things and it doesn't make them happy. You can't have, find happiness in, in fast cars and vacations and luxury and lots of hot women and lots of money. Eventually, you understand that. It might take you 10, 20 years of chasing that stuff until eventually you realize that it doesn't work. It's going to make you miserable. It's going to make you depressed. It's going to make you addicted. It's going to um, perhaps make you suicidal and cause all sorts of health problems and so forth and relationship problems, all that materialistic stuff. And then eventually you're going to realize that this whole material attitude is wrong. And then what's, what's the alternative? Once you've exhausted materialism, what's left? Spirituality. That's when you discover genuine spirituality. And then you start working towards that. And then you realize, oh, but I can't do that because I have all these bad habits of manipulating, exploiting, stealing, lying, cheating that I used to get all the stuff that I thought would make me happy. And now I realize that none of that makes me happy. Yeah. You know what that else is called? That's called selling your soul to the devil. That's what you did. Andrew Tate is the devil, and you sold him your soul for promises of sex and some money and some Bugattis. That's literally what you did. That's all that this is. <laughs> it ain't rocket science, what you're doing here. It's very simple. This is as tale as old as, as mankind. Mankind has been falling into this trap since the dawn of history. This is what the Bible teaches you. 
This is what Buddhism teaches you. This is what any uh, serious spiritual teaching or teacher will teach you, is that this doesn't work. It can't work. Controlling, manipulating people, chasing after wealth, it can't work. And not that you can't get wealth. You can get wealth. I've gotten wealth. It just, it, it doesn't make you happy. It doesn't solve your life's problems. Now you might say, well, Leo, you, yeah, sure, it's easy for you to say because you're already successful, you already got your wealth, and now it's like you're sitting on your high horse here, your high horse here, talking down to me uh, with all your money and stuff, and it's easy for you to say, but I'm just working my nine to five job, I can barely pay my bills. Well, at one point I was like you. I had to find a way out of that. I had to work my way out of that. I had to make very careful choices to work out of that. The reality is that most people who are stuck in a financial bind or most people who are not getting laid, they are in such a desperate situation that they think that their desperation justifies them acting in these unethical ways and these gimmicky ways that it's gonna, you know, Leo, I can act in a gimmicky way to get sex because I need it ba badly. Yeah, but what you don't realize is that by acting in this gimmicky way to get that sex that you need so badly, you're actually going to shoot yourself in the foot and you're not going to get the sex and you're just going to waste your time and your money. What I suggest for you is that the more desperate you are for money, for sex, for, for whatever, that should be a, uh, a clarion call to you to get serious and to drop all the gimmicks. You don't have the luxury for gimmicks in your situation if you're that desperate. Yeah, think about that. Unfortunately, most of the skills and tactics that you use to acquire all of the materialistic stuff, the flashy stuff that you think is gonna make you happy, not only is it just a waste of all your resources because you're just going to burn that money and never get it back on things that are worthless, like a Bugatti or a, you know bottle service at a nightclub, you're just burning $5,000 right there doing that. Um, not only will you burn that money, but even worse than that, the very methods that you ingrain because your mind is like a, you know, it's like a, everything is ingrained in your mind. Your mind is, is not that as flexible as people think. The mind is like cement. Your habits get cemented in there and they can take years to unwire if you got bad habits. You're gonna get a lot of bad habits and you're gonna build a fundamentally low integrity character, which will then, that's the worst part of it, because then you're gonna have to use that to climb out of this hole that you've dug for yourself when you start doing spiritual work, because you're gonna have all these bad habits. And spirituality is about truth. There is no spirituality without the value of truth, which requires integrity. So be careful. We live in dangerous times. There are a lot of grifters and flashy con artist types on social media selling you all sorts of schemes. Get rich quick schemes, business in a box schemes, getting laid schemes, getting skinny schemes, getting rich via Ponzi scheme uh, or via crypto schemes, um, this, all this kind of stuff. And um, you have to be wiser than all of that if you want genuine success. I can show you how to create genuine success, but it ain't gonna look flashy. The stuff I teach, it ain't flashy, but it's deep. You can feel its depth. Compare what I'm talking about with Andrew Tate or anybody else out there. You'll see the depth of what I'm talking about. This is grounded in serious spiritual principles that I couldn't even begin to communicate to you now because they're way over your head. Although you can find them throughout all my work if you are so inclined. It'll probably take you a couple hundred hours just to familiarize yourself with the body of my work. So anyways, let's get back to this point. I kind of fell off track on is that, um, remember your values and level of consciousness and integrity is gonna determine what kind of people you surround yourself with and especially what kind of women you attract into your life. 
So this is a very common mistake that I see a lot of PUAs and um, guys who are really successful with women who love to use women just as sex objects uh, to satisfy the sexual needs. Um, this is what ends up happening. These guys are not invulnerable. They fall in love with women. They just end up ha having to fall in love with very toxic, low quality women. And one of the things they, they do is they complain. They say, well, you know, Leo, why would I even want to respect a girl? All I need to do, all I need from a girl is just to fuck her. And then, you know, I can have a lot more fun uh, and get a lot more joy just talking with my buddies and my friends. I don't need a girl. You know, girls are stupid anyways, right? Um, they like to whine. They're not intelligent. They can't keep up with, my, with me in conversation, all this kind of stuff. That's what Andrew Tate might say. Uh, here's what's really going on though, is that, it's not that girls are that way, it's that you're attracting those kinds of girls because your attitude is such, you're so disrespectful towards, towards women that the only kinds of women who would acquiesce to your schemes and to your philosophy are the least intelligent, the most abused, the most toxic, the most drug addicted, um, the most emotionally damaged on the planet. Those are the women that you're selecting without even understanding that you're selecting them. See, it's not that you wake up in the morning or Andrew Tate wakes up in the morning and says, you know what? I want to attract a, a girl who's the most emotionally abused, sexually traumatized, lowest self-esteem, um, and has mental illnesses and addictions. That's what I want. No, he doesn't say that, of course. But in practice, when he calls four of his girlfriends to come and sit down with him in Romania, and he tells them this webcam scheme, in practice, when he gives them this ultimatum of like, well, are you staying with me or you can go? Any girl who is not psychologically damaged or who doesn't have mental illness, doesn't have any addiction, has a decent career, has a de decent level of intelligence, went to university, has something going in her life and so forth, has a good family life, She's going to leave. She's not going to put up with this bullshit. The only girls that will stay will be those who have something wrong with them, deeply, deeply wrong. And then this is going to create a self-fulfilling prophecy effect where Andrew Tate is going to keep attracting these kinds of girls. And then he's going to say to himself, well, but all girls are dumb and they're also stupid and they're addicted and they're irresponsible and they're sloppy and they're, um, They've got all sorts of mental issues and whatever else, and they're dramatic and they're emotional, all this sort of stuff. Yeah, because those are the only kind of girls that would subscribe to your disrespectful, toxic scheme. Your toxicity attracts toxicity. Healthy people don't like being around toxic people who control and manipulate them. See, the thing is, is that humans are very sensitive to being manipulated by others. When you are being controlled, dominated, and manipulated by another person, you don't like it. Andrew Tate wouldn't like it if somebody controlled and manipulated him. But then he does not extend that same respect to his women because he doesn't have empathy for them. Because he doesn't view them as sovereign conscious entities as he himself is, which is a fundamental untruth in his philosophy. And so it is with pickup people as well. I have pickup friends who are very successful with girls, have slept with hundreds of girls, but they keep attracting the most toxic women and they can't help themselves. These women have mental disorders, they're abusive. Uh, one, of my, one of my pickup buddies, his girlfriend had borderline personality disorder and she was so toxic that she would physically beat him and injure him. She stole all of his furniture. She destroyed his apartment. She broke. She was so toxic that even his roommate that he lived with um, couldn't stand to live with him anymore. They broke up. I mean, two good friends broke up because the girlfriend was so toxic. Um... She would stalk him. She would harass him. He would change his number. She would find his number, keep calling him, pestering him for months. This went on for months, for years. This went on extremely toxic. 
These are the kind of girls you're going to attract. Because a healthy girl is not going to put up with that shit. Why would she? Why would she put up with all the cheating and all the lying and manipulating that is required to maintain these harems of girls? So be very careful. Your views of women will tend to get reflected back at you. That's what I want to warn you about, you manosphere um, ideologists. You know, whether you're into red pill, black pill, incel, MGTOW, Andrew Tateism, some pickup theory, mystery method, whatever it is, um, all these systems and schemes and philosophy come with a certain attitude, a philosophy towards women in general. And in fact, the whole manosphere community has a certain attitude towards women. It's usually quite disrespectful, misogynistic. They talk about women as sluts and whores and cheaters and stupid and dumb and disloyal and... Um, Basically, they project all of their personal grievances and immaturities onto women. And then, um, and then, of course, once you have that attitude and then you go out and start to attract women, because you, you have to, I mean, you're, you're a horny guy. As much as you hate women, you, you still want to fuck them. And so you create this very toxic dynamic where it's like, I want to fuck you, but actually I hate you deep down inside. And it's funny, it's like it's it's scary how real this is because one of the, the the most recent leaked audio tapes recordings of Andrew Tate with one of his abusers who he is alleged to have raped, they actually have a recording. And um and he's on this call and he's telling this this poor girl, he's saying that, you know, you know, I choked you last night, but don't be like a crybaby about it. He said something along those lines. And then he said, you know, you know what? I actually enjoyed it. The more afraid you were, the more you didn't like it, the more I enjoyed it. He actually said that. Yeah, that's exactly the dynamic. I am not surprised at all that Andrew Tate has sex with his girlfriends and he actually hates them deep down inside. Because he doesn't respect them. He doesn't respect women. This creates a very toxic attitude towards women in general. Because see, if there's something in the world that you hate, but then you need something from the thing that you hate, which is in this case, namely sex, this is gonna be a very dysfunctional dynamic. Because it's not like you hate women, but then you're gonna go become a monk. No, you hate women, but then secretly you're still jerking off to them. You're fantasizing about them every night. You're going to pick them up at the nightclub or you know, you have a girlfriend or something like that, but it just becomes very toxic. It's because women are weaker than men that strong, good men need to respect women and not to exploit them. You know, with me, it's gotten to the point, like, if I have a girlfriend and I'm texting with her, you know, sometimes a girl isn't quite behaving the way you want. Like, maybe she's not coming over, she's being kind of flaky, or she's giving you some attitude or whatever. And so what you can do is, like, there's different text messages you can send. And, you know, if I want to manipulate a girl, I know how to manipulate a girl into coming over or whatever else. But like, I can see, my, I can watch myself, even sometimes it's very innocent forms of manipulation. Like I, I'm so attuned to how manipulative I can be just because I've studied my own psyche so well that um, I can anticipate myself just, you know, typing in a little joke just to shift her mood a little bit because I know that manipulating her mood by, you know, making her laugh a little bit, it's going to make it a little bit easier to ask her to come over, something like that. And what I, what I have to train myself as part of my spiritual and development work is what I have to train myself is to not do that. That's the, that's the extreme that I'm talking about. When you, 
if you want to reach the highest levels of spirituality, you have to let go of all your manipulations. You can't manipulate people anymore. You can't lie to them anymore. It's really challenging. <laughs> you, you are, you're going into a boxing match with two hands tied behind your back at that point. That's what spirituality becomes. That's why so few people do it because it's a lot easier to survive without both your hands tied behind your back. It's a lot easier to get sex when you can allow yourself to type anything into the text message box you want. I would get laid a lot more if I allowed myself to type anything I wanted to into those text message boxes when I'm texting with girls. I deliberately don't allow myself. I handicap myself. Why do I do that? Because I know that in the end, I'm going to win on integrity and I'm going to win on truth. That's where my joy in life is going to come from. It's going to come from truth. It's not going to come from fucking a girl one extra time. Now, does that mean I have to be celibate for the rest of my life? No, I can still play around here and there. I still do a little manipulation. I mean, it's very hard to eliminate all manipulation from all of your relationships. Watch yourself. The next time you're texting with a girl or with a guy, if you're a girl, I mean, girls manipulate as well. Um, Watch how you manipulate people. Watch how you manipulate your family. Just little things you say to manipulate them. You think that this is innocent and that you're going to escape with this. You're not. So one of the spiritual rules is that you don't escape with anything. Every lie, every deception, every little game you play, every little, you know, every little trick, every manipulation, it all comes back to bite you in the ass. You don't get away with anything. You just have... Lie to yourself to think that you will. It all has a cost. You just don't understand the costs yet. It takes a lot of spiritual development and maturity to start to understand those costs. Likewise, I have urges to manipulate my customers. I have urges to charge you more money. I have urges to put out YouTube content that's clickbait, that's reactionary, that's fluff and filler and not the best content. I have urges to lock my best content behind paywalls so I get paid more. I have those urges. I have to contend with all of those. That's part of my spiritual work. And I'm not saying I'm perfect in resisting all those urges. Sometimes I give in here or there. You know, I'm not, I'm not perfect at it. But um, to the extent that I do maintain my integrity, that's the extent to which I maintain the integrity of my brand. And that's the extent to which Folks like you are attracted to this work and find something unique and special about it that's different from all the other blowhards out there on YouTube peddling you with, you know, their fantasies and schemes. You don't understand yet the depth of what you've gotten yourself into here with personal development. Andrew Tate has shown you just a little, a little tip of the iceberg of how personal development works. But he hasn't actually developed himself seriously, internally. Therefore, he can't actually teach you or tell you what personal development involves or what spiritual development involves. There are many levels of personal development I have videos explaining that. Go check out my series called Spiral Dynamics, which is very powerful in that regard. It'll change your whole understanding of personal development. Also go check out my series called The Nine Stages of Ego Development. That will recontextualize many things for you. That's a three-part series. Go check that out. Check out my episode, What is Wisdom? Check out my episode, What is Integrity? Check out my episode, Understanding Bias. If you're interested in spirituality, check out my episode, What is Spirituality? If you're interested in truth, check out my episode, What is Truth? Check out my episode, What is Love? If you want to know how to get laid, because Andrew Tate didn't teach you how to get laid. If you want to know how to get laid, check out my episode, How to Get Laid, Part 1, Part 2, Part 3. That's going to be much more practical and realistic for the majority of you, and it requires little money. It also teaches you how to do it in an ethical manner. See, there are ethical and unethical ways of getting laid. 
one of the problems I have with the whole mana sphere is that it completely neglects the field of ethics and integrity when it comes to relating with the opposite sex. This is a gigantic oversight. Be careful once you get drawn into these online, online ideologies like red pill or pickup or black pill, it's going to corrupt your entire mind. And the way that it works is that it's so subtle. Again, the way the human psyche works is that once you've adopted some kind of ideology or worldview, when you look out at the world, the world is going to reflect that back at you such that you think that you're correct in your worldview. So if you think that women are lying, cheating whores and sluts, and they're loyal, they're disloyal, um, and that they need to be manipulated and, and so forth, if that's your attitude, you're going to see that reflected back at you. And you're going to create that kind of a reality for yourself. And then you're going to be living in that hell. You don't want that. In the future, I'll have an episode called Conscious Leadership, where I'll teach you that. In the future, I'll also have an episode called Conscious Relationships, where I'll go into what it takes to create a conscious relationship with a woman. And also, I have an episode called The Social Matrix, which explains to you what the matrix really is. When Tate or pickup guys, red pill guys, when they talk about the matrix, you know, the red pill, what is that? That's from the matrix. Supposedly the red pill is supposed to wake you up from the matrix. Tate is supposed to wake you up from the matrix. Pickup is supposed to wake you up from the matrix. You ain't waking up from any matrix. That is the matrix. You have no idea what the matrix really is. There is a matrix. But the matrix is so twisted, so deep, and so counterintuitive that you can't even imagine, you wouldn't believe if I told you what the matrix is. That's something that I have to introduce to you over many, many, many hours, slowly, gradually introduce you to the concept of what the real matrix is and what it takes to escape it. That's what I teach. <laughs> That's my whole life's work, is teaching you how to escape the real matrix, by which I mean jailbreaking your own mind, escaping the constructions of your own mind. If you want to understand more about that, check out my episode, whatisactualized.org, which explains that in more detail, talking about the concept of jailbreaking the mind. And then that ties in with the concept of spirituality. Spirituality boils down to the pursuit of truth, the slaying of all your internal mental illusions and deceptions and lies until you jailbreak your mind so completely that you transcend the material dimensions of reality into new spiritual dimensions that you can't even imagine exist right now that seem like fantasy. When you truly escape the matrix, see, the matrix is not the government. It's not, the, it's not the U.S. government. It's not the globalist elites. Um, it's not the deep state. It's not the World Economic Forum. Uh, it's not capitalism either. What I mean when I say to escape the matrix, when you really escape the matrix you'll realize that your parents are a hallucination of your own mind. That's what would be truly escaping the matrix. And then all these monkeys on YouTube who are talking about escaping the matrix, they're just feeding you bullshit. It's just illusions, fantasies. Owning a Bugatti is escaping the matrix. Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> Having sex with women. Uh, sex trafficking uh, webcam girls. This is this is escaping the matrix. Buying yourself a bunch of guns. Living in Romania is escaping the matrix. Teaching a bunch of guys how to how to scam people out of money is escaping the matrix. No, this is this is just pure human stupidity, recapitulated. There's nothing new about this. You're not escaping anything. There's nothing original about this at all. 
it's just a, a cynical ploy for Andrew Tate to to get power and money and sex for himself. So anyways, I hope this has helped to set you straight a little bit. Uh, there's a lot more that could be said about all these kinds of um, uh, topics. I really felt like, um, even though we were talking about like Andrew Tate, we're all, we're, we were bringing together and kind of weaving together here a lot of different strands from my body of work, from psychology, from spirituality, from success with women, how to be a man, all this kind of stuff. This is what real development looks like. It's messy, it's complicated, and it's not something you want to hear. If somebody is telling you development advice and spiritual advice and business advice that sounds really good and exciting to you, they're feeding you bullshit. You understand this? Because the reality of acing these domains, acing relationships, acing business, acing uh, being good with girls, this requires facing very difficult truths that burn and sting you. And then when it comes to acing spirituality, that's the most difficult field of all because there's, there's, there's no room for error there. There's no room for lying. There's no room for fantasy. There's no room for bullshit. There's no room for human games and uh, puffing yourself up and social media gimmickry and this kind of stuff. It's purely about truth. It requires ruthless, ruthless self-honesty and changing your whole orientation towards reality. Um, because most people, the way they become successful is by manipulating the shit out of reality. If you manipulate the shit out of reality, you can become quite successful, but you're not going to become happy. That's guaranteed. And so if you're wise, eventually you're going to realize that, well, all my manipulations have led me to a, a very dark, sad place. And um, I only have two options now. Either I'm going to kill myself because I'm just too depressed, or I have to change fundamentally and let go of these manipulations. And then uh, what comes after that? How do you create success without all the manipulations? and all the gimmicks. That's the real question you should be asking yourself. And most of what these Ty Lopez characters are teaching you, even if they do teach you some way of making money, which of course they, they teach something, but what they're teaching you is they're teaching you very crude forms of um, psychological manipulation, basically. But they're not telling you the costs because they don't care about your well-being at all. They don't care about the long-term success of your life. So as long as they can just sell you something so you don't get a refund from them, don't, don't ask for a refund, you know, that, that's good enough for them. So they're not, they're not giving you like the, they're not telling you the costs because, not necessarily because they're bad characters. A lot of times they just don't, they don't know the costs. See, I, I'm quite sure that Andrew Tate does not understand the costs of his own philosophy. Now, well, maybe... Now that he's in a jail cell, it's going to dawn on him a little bit more. He's probably going to get a little bit reflective and start to think about the costs, at least if he's honest. If he wants to, he can double down on his narcissism and deny everything and, you know, proclaim himself to be a hero even in his own mind. But if he's, if he's, if he's serious, he might have a change of heart, which I hope he does, and he uses this time to self-reflect and to, to really ask himself, you know, take responsibility, ask himself, how did I end up here? What got me here? And um, he can track the steps back in his life, and you know he, he can track back from all the webcam girls back to to his you know to his gambling days and his drug dealing days and all that, his kickboxing days, and he can see you know where did it go wrong. And what he'll realize is that fundamentally it went wrong at the level of character, at the level of integrity, at the level of truth. That's where the first crack begins in the foundation because the foundation has to be built on truth. All right. I hope that's helped you and um, I hope you check out those other resources that I mentioned for you.
I'm done here. Please uh, click the like button. Check out all the work that I have here for you. Come check out my website. On the website, you'll find my blog. You'll find uh, various kinds of resources, my book list. You'll find my life purpose course. can help you set your direction in your life. You can find the Actualized Forum. You can support me at patreon.com slash actualized. And uh, I'll see you in the future with more deep videos.